Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a, a little later than usual episode of the show, episode 100, no less, but uh, 10 o'clock show tonight, mainly because Dave's on the West Coast, and he's a busier guy than I am, so uh, we're, I wanted to accommodate him, and uh, I'm glad everybody was willing to uh, go back and do some chores around the house before we start tonight's episode, but uh, as you can see, there's no backdrop, right? I told you I was packing everything up, and it's all in boxes right now outside of that cap shield and a few other props because I've got some filming to do for tomorrow's Dueling Dealers episode. So that's it. Painting on the walls going uh, going partially underway here so far. Uh, David thought it looked like a nice leopard pattern. If he hadn't, uh, if he had, if I hadn't told him, he would have said, he said that uh, it, maybe it was a nice style, something I was trying to change to here in the room. But uh, David is in the green room and I want to bring him out here because uh, he is the man of the hour. Hey, David, how are you? Hey, how are you, Bill? Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for the extra hour. I appreciate it here uh, here in L.A., so thank you, everyone. No, it's uh, it's it's our pleasure, David. I mean, like I said, I really do think out of uh, all the people I know, you probably are more busy than I am. So, I mean, I'm just so glad <laughs> that you were able to make a weeknight available for me. To, to talk. Uh, happy to do it. I was mostly busy today, literally just taking my son to day camp. So that was a lot of my day and, and a little bit of editing, but yes. Uh, uh, but regular, regular driving around with my kids like anybody it's else. Parenting. So yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we talked in the green room. I, I felt like before we like dive into original comic art, and, and I think the interesting thing is going to be, I think people have kind of their mindset on like what things we're going to talk about tonight. And I, I thought it was really interesting. <laughs> the artworks that you selected are probably not the ones that most people were expecting you to pick. And I think that that's going to make for a fun show. I mean, so many of us yeah, are I sort familiar. Of I sort of felt like, and again, if you know, and again, people can ask questions about anything they want to ask. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was kind of like I felt like, you know, I've done various other, you know, whatever podcasts and uh, uh, Felix comic art and whatnot, mm -hmm. and I've talked about certain things and certain pieces. I don't know. The story is the story, and, and I'm not trying to be, you know, flippant about it. The the giant size X Men is a great piece, but. I'm not sure I have anything new to say about it. Do you know what I mean? It it's yeah. great. It's really great. I really love it. It's not for sale. Um, you know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> so I tried to pick some other things that are, you know, giant size X Men adjacent, but mm -hmm. that would be kind of at least some stories that you hadn't heard, people hadn't heard, or maybe some pieces that maybe like you know, again, are connected to the comics and stuff that I like, but maybe not the ones people think about. So anyway, who knows? Maybe this will be the least popular of all your 100 episodes. <laughs> well, I doubt that, but we'll, but we'll see. So what I thought we could do just to kind of get it out of the way before we talk about your origin story and looking and look at the, at the artwork, talk a little bit about your career in, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur and the things that you've done in the creative space with, with film and television, because, sure. you know, a lot of people, you know, I've heard a lot, but I, we've never, you and I have really never talked too often as, a, as you know i know a lot about you but even i don't know everything that you've you've done yeah. in film and television i mean it's a it's a uh, you know i'll give us the quickest version and again people are welcome to ask as much as they like or don't like um uh, I, I'm basically, I mean, I think of myself as a comedy writer. That, that's what I am. I'm a comedy writer. I, uh, I started writing comedy um, in college. I sort of fell into it writing for the Harvard Lampoon, which is sort of the precursor of the National Lampoon at Harvard University. And I was very interested in comedy. I'd always been a movie and TV fan. And so I was sort of interested in it, but didn't quite know, you know, no one in my family was a writer. I didn't know, like, I didn't know any writers. I didn't know, like, how do you do this? And so I was very interested in it. I was writing, you know, comedy in college, but at the same time, I was honestly, I was doing like, you know, regular job interviews with like Procter and Gamble to move to like Ohio and do brand <laughs> management. You know what I mean? Cause I didn't know. Um, and luckily I got an offer uh, from comedy central to go down. And uh, the first thing I ever worked on was uh, Indecision 92, which was a uh, comedy coverage of the Democratic and uh, Republican National Conventions hosted by Al Franken. And mm -hmm. that kind of got me going. So early on, political comedy, comedy, working with Al Franken from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Al ended up recommending me to Lorne Michaels at Saturday Night Live. I went to SNL. I did three years at SNL from 92 to 95, which was the heyday and the end of like... Phil Hartman and Dana Carvey and those guys and the rise of Sandler, Farley, Spade, those guys. Mm -hmm. And then in 95, 
I left um, and went out to LA, moved to LA. I was a New Yorker and moved out to LA. Uh, and uh, I went to work at Seinfeld uh, and worked there for three years, basically the back three episodes, the back three seasons of the, the, the final three episodes, the final three seasons of Seinfeld. Um, in there, among the things I did was the biggie that comic fans always kind of like is um, the uh, the uh, Bizarro Jerry episode, which mm -hmm. uh, sort of has also led into my collecting a bit. We can talk about that later. Yep. Um, but if you, I, I, Jerry was a Superman fan, and so Superman references were things that Jerry did. Um, but the Bizarro, that was me. And then I think I'm also responsible for, there's a couple of good, there's an Iron Man joke. There's a good discussion between Jerry and George about what Iron Man wears under his suit. And then all of the Wrath of Khan references, those are me as well. So that's my fingerprints on Seinfeld. And basically uh, Seinfeld ended and I did a little bit of other TV things, a lot of things, of course, that no one ever got to see because, you know, the things shows you work on that don't happen. But uh, the big one I did that a lot of comic fans like was the Clerks animated show with uh, Kevin Smith. We did six episodes with two of which aired on network television, the rest that lived on in semi infamy. That was really fun. Started doing movie stuff, um, ended up writing and co-directing uh, Euro Trip. Uh, Got, did a little bit of work with uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, kind of did a lot of that stuff, other things, and kind of somewhere in there, started doing Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David, also started directing Curb Your Enthusiasm as well as writing it with him, did a number of years of that, and then segued from that into, I took over as showrunner of Veep uh, from uh, Armando Iannucci, who had created the show and was reunited with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and basically... Uh, did the final three seasons of Veep uh, to much, uh, thank gosh, uh, some nice acclaim and people seem to like it and showered us with good yes, things. Yes, they did. Um, and then since then, I have endlessly been working on a uh, Watergate show uh, for HBO, a miniseries called uh, called uh, White House Plumbers, which I am not allowed to announce the date quite yet, but uh, sometime in the next calendar, well, I don't know about calendar year, the next 365 days, hopefully people will see it. I'll leave that at that. And that's kind of uh, my career in a quick nutshell. Uh, I'm liking seeing, I'm seeing a lot of Euro trip. So God and bless you all. Kids. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where any of you were when the movie came out. I'm <laughs> guessing you were children. Uh, well, not you, Nick Perucci. You were not a child then. Sorry. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it was uh, rated R just as they started cracking down on like not letting kids in under 17 uh and i believe we came in third or fourth our opening weekend but anyway um you know eventually all things become cult hits so there you go yeah <laughs> um i hope that explains something as quick as i could uh it does well how do you you know i mean th that's an incredible career and you really are kind of i think just hitting your stride, right? I mean, it feels like either I, my stride or the end. We'll or see. The end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, let's not think like that. I mean, it's, to me, it just seems pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, as a self-motivated person who's like kind of pursued their, their dreams and everything, it's clearly you have as well. And you've fallen into, you know, it, it's, I'm sure it's not just luck to have gotten to work with the people you've gotten to work with. I mean, you no, know, it's, you, every, it's every parent's dream. My parents worked very hard to send me to Harvard where I barely went to classes and became a comedy writer. They're very pleased. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I get it. I get it. We, uh, you know, my mom sent me to art school. She wanted me to be an artist and I, I'm not anything that they were expecting, but I think they're, they're still pretty happy with how I turned out. I, I, but I, I get it, man. I get but if you it. Were an least... artist, if you were an artist, I don't think you'd be a collector. I feel like those who can't. True. I, I am a frustrated artist. I wish I could draw. I still draw like I'm eight years old. Like my son is like that with like the, the lines of the rays and whatever. And it is partially because I think, honestly, I'm such a frustrated, like wish I could draw that I, it's part of what I love about comic art collecting, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's the, my own sort of, you know, those who can't collect kind of thing. If, if that it's makes true. Sense. Yeah. You know, I, I've, uh, the one thing that I, my biggest takeaway from the last two years of doing all the interviews that I've done and conversations is that, you know, by and large, everybody or most people who are art collectors have a creative backbone in them somewhere, whether it was, you know, they, they're, they want, want to be an artist, they want to be a writer, their parents were musicians, you know, they, they grew up in a creative environment. And, you know, I, I, cause I get asked a lot. It's like, why aren't there more art collectors? And I'm like, they're, 
art collectors don't really grow on trees. You kind of it's it's something innate in you that draws you to it. You know, you you can love the comics. You can maybe buy a print. Maybe you'll buy a statue. But convincing a uh, you know your average Joe comic book collector to uh, consider buying well, original art. Let's not even. I mean, let's not even talk about you know. Let's go one step bigger for a second because mm -hmm. uh, we talk about a little bit of this on. Uh, I, I saw a couple of people giving a couple of shout outs. Uh, I co-host a uh, a podcast, the Stuff Dreams Are Made Up, which yep. is about ostensibly about movie prop collecting that I co-host with uh, Ryan Condal, who is the uh, the upcoming creator and showrunner of House of Dragon, the new uh, the new uh, the big uh, Game, of Game of Thrones coming yeah. uh, the, coming this fall on HBO. Um, and we talk a lot about, you know, what makes a collector. And I know lots of people with, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Certainly unlimited means, you know, that that could collect. They, they look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm not talking about big ticket items. Just they have, they're just not people that have any interest in, accumulating things or tchotchkes or however you want to think about it, whatever you, however you want to think about it. And by the way, I also know other guys where they go like, Oh yeah, I'm not a collector. And then I go, what do you mean? You have 20 cars. You are a collector. You just are collecting this other thing. So they, I think there are different types of people, but yeah, I do think there's something about the art specifically that I think, you know, motivates people into art collecting. And mm -hmm. certainly for me, it's nostalgia is a big part of it, obviously, but also the process and that desire to see beyond the, the, the panel and see the notes and see, you know, the, the fixes and all of those kinds of things. And, and in some extent, the mistakes in a way. So anyway, that, that's, I think, a big part of what drew me to the art uh, sure. back in the day. No, yeah. Same same here. Yeah. Without question. Nostalgia still plays a really big role for me that, you know, as a early on, it was just I was very like character focused. But the older I get, it seems like I'm more drawn to those books that I was reading off the spinner racks and everything, yeah. you know, more than anything. So sure. Sure, I, I get that. But, uh, you know, and just so everybody knows, I did link to your podcast in the show. Oh, show. thank you. I appreciate that. Everybody who is not familiar with uh, with that podcast should definitely check it out. I've uh, I listened to it from time to time. I didn't get to hear your prop store uh, pre-auction and post-auction recaps, but uh, but I've heard they're... Uh, they were they were very good. <laughs> they, I, it is truly for anybody. And again, what I was going after and the amount of, that it might have cost because I, I, you know, spoiler alert, I did not win. But for anybody who's ever thought about like spending sort of more money than they were comfortable doing on something, whatever your level is, I sort of tried to have those conversations in the podcast with my co-host live mm -hmm. I mean, not live but i mean basically just straight out into the mic sort of the the what was going through my head and right. i don't know i think again i think you can like it even if it's it's about collecting it's not about prop collecting it's about all collecting and sure. what you know am i making a mistake is this too much will it hold its value what do i sell what do i get rid of if i'm going to do this all of those things and again i think those certainly uh, i think are the universal things uh that hopefully uh you know i think certainly comic art collectors i think especially these days um are probably quite familiar with where it seems like everything we try and you know go for you have is, is a consideration there's not a lot of the, the days of reasonably priced art are fewer and far between i leave it at that so yeah oh it, i i completely agree i'm not a player at that level i can only imagine but I, again, I think it's any level because one man's a sure. thousand is another man's ten thousand. True, you know. Yeah. So well, it's we whatever, about earlier. whatever, yeah, whatever your level is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Right. No. No. I. I. I well, you're yeah. absolutely right. If I if I'm a buyer at five thousand, that's my max. I mean, I'm going to be going through the I'm same. Just gonna, yeah. I'm just simply saying, is if five thousand is a couple of piece. months of your rent or whatever it is, or your mortgage mm -hmm. payments, then that's a giant. I mean, again, I, I, there's no judgment here. It's just sort of whatever that number is that you are contemplating and you know bargaining with god over that's collecting you know <laughs> <laughs> oh man i haven't thought of it like that before <laughs> but you're but you're you, i think you uh, you nailed it with that one but so so when you look at the hobby i mean we might you know just as uh, from your perspective um i mean to me the art's really finally getting its due right i mean it's, it's finally realizing the the values that we've kind of always felt original comic art should have, but we're happy when it wasn't realizing that, you know, 15, 10 years ago. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, what you, you always looked at it's like, this is a piece of, you know, of American history, you know, if you're collecting American comic book art, and you're wondering why it's, it's you know, 
one one hundredth the comic book, you know, the price of a graded comic book that that art came from. And now finally, the arts, uh, you know, at least getting into a, a fair fair level with a highly graded comic book. And uh, you know, I think that, you know we're we're just at the infancy of really find, discovering what those values are, at least for the the prime pieces from you know the '60s and '70s or whatnot. But um, but you know, a lot of people like to think that we're in a bubble. Like there's just like it was. It's related to like the the, the things that we saw in the economy before this. You know, the la the latest collapse. You know, like with the housing market or whatnot. But but I don't think it's like that at all. I mean, I think we're finally it's finally getting the credibility that. Uh, that we all knew that it should have and the creators are finally being recognized as uh you know true cr contributors to american you know to our culture and uh and we're losing so many creators now too so i think all those things kind of happening at the same no, time. no i mean certainly yeah. this these last whatever couple of months with you know and i have no doubt i'm forgetting people but obviously um you know neil neil adams george perez tim sale uh, i'm sure there were others that are just escaping me at the moment you know it was just I mean, just sad and depressing. However, uh, the only bright side, I guess, that I saw was it was really nice to see these people in a world where, obviously, comic properties are so dominating pop mm -hmm. culture that these people did get their you know moments in the sun in terms of you know news coverage, which I did think was a a very you know uh, the one I guess bright side. Um, the prices surprise me. They also don't surprise me. I do think there is, I think it's connected to the economy. I do think we are in a world of speculation right now, which mm -hmm. is never fun. I think some of the same people who have been driving comic books have come over to comic art. I can't swear they are true blue collectors in the were in the way that I I don't know, I guess like to think of myself. And I think people like to think of themselves. It is what it is, though. That is life. So, you know, it, it is it is it is the world. But I, you know, again, it, it's, you know, you 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 take the good with the bad. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess I'll sit here and simply say at the end of the day, I'd rather be a collector than not be a collector. And certainly <laughs> of comic art, you know, just in terms of the people that I've gotten to know and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And the I don't know, just, you know, just the whole the whole experience. That being said. I don't know, you know, three million for uh, whatever an interior, uh, an interior page of uh, whatever the first appearance, not first appearance of the black costume. I don't know what that quite is. So you know, uh, yeah, that one, that yeah. one definitely. Yeah. You know, we all, I, I think we've all kind of realized that as original art, it wasn't original art collector that picked up that piece. It's impossible because we. Anybody in their right mind that could afford that piece would have stopped at a million dollars, and even then, that would have been a lot of money. I, 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 but, I don't, I don't know who got it. I don't no, know. No, neither who do didn't I. Get it. There had to have been two bidders. I don't know. It, I have no good answer. It doesn't does not compute for me. And right. perhaps someday, you know, thirty years from now, when it sells for forty billion dollars, I'll be like, boy, they were much smarter than me. But I don't know. I also think there's the possibility that that thing won't you know, be worth $40 billion unless it's like water world and paper is very precious commodity in general <laughs> and what's drawn on it won't really matter. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we shall see. Uh, but yeah, but nope. uh, there is speculation. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, Chuck Arnold asked, uh, do, you, do you think there are significantly more art collectors now? I mean, I don't feel like there's, it's a dramatic increase in the number. Yeah, of I don't know. If, uh, Chuck, I, hi, Chuck. I don't know about significantly. There are definitely more art collectors. There mm -hmm. are new art collectors every day, I think, in a good way. Um, significantly, I, I don't know, because you also lose some too. So, you know, when I think back, to when I first started getting serious about it in the mid nineties, there are guys that were big names, you know, heavy hitters back then that are, are still, I think like comics and stuff like that. Hey, Jimmy Palmiotti in the house. How are you, hey, Jimmy? Right. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, but some of them are gone. And I, it's not that they don't love comics. It's just, they've moved on in their lives. They've moved on, you know, whatever. And just, you know, that uh, anyway, it's so, true. So significant, I don't know. There are definitely more, though, uh, sure. which is great, which is wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of the newer collectors who've come in in the last five years are uh, 
very big uh, 90s collectors, for instance. They're a little bit younger than we are, and the 90s is their sweet spot. And we've seen a, in the last two years a huge spike in in artwork from that period. You know, books that I'm not even familiar yeah. with that are just, and I think it's that influx of collectors. And, and like you said, collectors come and go. I, I was talking with Tim Townsend at Megacon a few months ago. Hey, Joe. And just said, Sorry, just yelling hey, that out there. Hey, oh, Joe. yeah. Oh, Joe. I'm very good. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the... Um, and yeah, you know, I said, Tim, you know, I don't really see you talk too much about your original art collecting because he was for me, he was big, you know, 20 years ago when mm -hmm. I started collecting original art. I mean, I really admired the fact that not only was he an artist collecting original art, he was savvy. You know, he was he was getting people to end eBay auctions to get, you know, John Byrne Alpha Flight pages. And I mean, I'm sitting there just in awe of, of this sure. guy. And so he and, he and he has a pretty darn amazing collection. But he said, you know, the last five years, I've just kind of phased myself out of it. Yeah. I still own a lot of it. But I just I'm just not interested in collecting anymore. And so if somebody who's who's a creative in comics is is kind of get gets burned out of it, we as you know, we as collectors can get. And again, I well. and again, I don't want to put words in Tim's mouth. Um, number one, I will say him phasing out of it has been one of the best things that ever happened to my collection because he's <laughs> occasionally offered me stuff. So that's number <laughs> one, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, number two. Uh, hey, Michael Perlman. Um, number two. Um, you know, I, he also has an incredible house with a pool, you know what I mean? So I, you know, I, I do think that, you know, you just, sometimes you, there are things and I've always thought to myself that there are definitely things that like, if the opportunity presented themselves, I would, you know, you know, I'd probably sell things I didn't think I would sell. And again, that's, I know that sounds like a very, whoa, what does he mean? I don't know what I mean. Certainly had I won that X-Wing, I definitely would have cracked open some, uh, in case of emergency break glass art, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I didn't have to. I mean, I would have had to, if I'd won that thing for $2 million, I would have had to have sold, I would have torn a Secret Wars page in half and sold half of it. So that would have covered that bill. So yeah, I wouldn't, you know, so that, that was what would have happened. But, uh, you know, I, again, I, you, life moves on, but it is that thing of there are guys from back then that don't. And look, here's, you know, whatever, I don't know, like a word to the war, you know, a word to, of warning for the future. You know, once upon a time, everybody thought, you know, strip art was the thing and that comic art pages were worthless. I and, know, isn't that funny? And, when I was getting in, those guys were still around and now, you know, not that, not that strip art isn't great and not that strip art isn't wonderful, but it is not, you know, the bee's knees anymore. And, you know, the market has shifted and someday, you know, you, you hear about these people, you know, these, these like older collectors that die and they have art on their walls, but it was the art that they collected, you know, whatever, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about they didn't have a Van Gogh. I just mean they had like some landscapes or something and collecting has moved on and nobody wants that anymore. And, uh, you know, it that it is, I don't know. I, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying, I, I do think about all these things, uh, you know, like late at night, uh, you know, when I can't sleep. So sure. I don't know, well, some of that, yeah. <laughs> you know what's happening today because so often, you know, like the, uh, this is the gentleman who collected Milton Kniffs who passed away recently. And uh, so we're seeing a lot of these really incredible Milton Kniffs be in the Wednesday auctions at Heritage. And they're incredible. And they're selling for fourteen, sixteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. And so that's that's a collector who had almost 600 Kniff strips because he just loved them, you know? And, yeah. uh, and so I think we're, you know, we are seeing those and, things. And it's happen. funny. And uh, I, I'm sort of, I got one eye on the side there. So mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry what I'm missing, but uh, Jimmy actually, Palmiotti just said it. It's the one thing I was literally talking to a guy today, a friend of mine, a uh, wonderful writer uh, wrote on the West wing. Uh, anyway, he picked up a piece of art that was from a Nick Lowe album cover. So uh, cool. it was basically a Nick Lowe album cover from a, a Bonhams auction that had a bunch of art by this guy who had done a lot of stuff for like Demon Records, which means like Nick Lowe and Elvis Costello stuff. And he picked this thing up, a couple of grand, whatever. And, you know, he was thrilled, but he was sort of ever so slightly worried, like, oh, did I pay too much? Did I pay too much? And I just said to him, look, I can't, I don't know. I, I, I this is not an area I know. I think what you got is incredible. It's very simple. Buy what you love. It's the only thing you can do. Buy what you love and just assume no one's ever going to want it because that's all you can sort of say or do. <laughs> and if that freaks you out, that the idea that somehow you can't profit on it, don't buy it or buy something. I mean, I don't know what else to say. If you, I have, I, I, the only couple of times, and they're not elaborate stories, but a couple of times where I've either sort of 
I don't know, lost something or just sort of a deal didn't work out, whatever. It's because the piece I had was ultimately a piece I didn't want in the first place. And I bought it because I thought it was a good price and I could quote unquote do something with it. And you do that two or three times and you just go, oh, I'm done with that nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I, I bought what I love and somehow accidentally, some of what I love is now, you know, ridiculously priced, but I only bought it because I loved it. I had no idea. And I always... I make this point, which I'll, I'll make here, and other people may have heard me say it in conversation or whatnot. You know, sometimes friends of mine who aren't collectors are just sort of like, you know, it's like a stock. It went up. You know, you sell it. You know, it's, isn't it great? It went up. And the difference is if I buy a, a share of, you know, whatever, Netflix, which, by the way, don't buy Netflix. Not going so well right now. But if I buy Netflix and it goes up and I decide, oh, it's so high, I'm going to sell it. And then, you know, whatever. And if I change my mind the next day and go, oh, God, I can't believe I sold that. I think I should have it. I can go buy it. If I, whatever, if I have, if I sell a Frank Miller Daredevil cover that I picked up in 1995, and again, I, I don't make, I don't mean to make this about the prices, but I picked it up in, you know, 95 for $750 and I mm -hmm. let it go for whatever the price is, you know, tomorrow, the odds are I'm never getting it back and possibly never getting any other Frank Miller cover daredevil cover to replace it. I mean, that's, and that's different that's than buying that. Yeah. That's different than buying a stock. And so mm -hmm. buy what you love the end. I don't know what else to say. So, yeah. Right. No, I think, I, I think a lot of collectors realize that today we've, we've said that, you know, several times too. No, of course, of you course. Sell yeah. something and, you know, today you may not be able to replace it. Even if you get a ridiculous amount for it. Um, you know, I was talking to a guy today who, was, is making a sizable profit on a piece of art that he has, you know, that he never thought he would sell. But I, and he was asking me if it, if it was a good deal. And I said, well, it's a good deal, but just remember, you're going to have a hard time replacing it. And so, so that, and, and that's the thing is, and if he is doing that because that money is going to change his life in a great way, or he needs the money for something sure. more power to him. But if he's just doing it because he thinks the offer is great, I don't know. Again, I'm, I, don't be, get, right. I, I don't want to get into anybody's business. It's just, no, like no, said, exa yeah. exactly. But I, I worry about that myself, that, you know, cause I'm just trying to get one good example from all sure. the creators that I love. And I, and I know that if I s sell it, I might have to pay double or triple that to get even a comparable piece today. Sure, you know, exactly. The price I paid, and two years or ago. maybe never get it again. I mean, the list of things that I'm still looking for, it, there, there's still a list, and things whether they are big prices or not even big prices, but just sort of things that other people like or whatever, they just not showing up and that's just part of collecting these days but anyway i don't have any answers that's a tight half hour we haven't looked at one piece of art but uh We're yeah right. um no but it's a good start it's good that's why you know david you know we could have a regular show talking about comic i have a feeling you've, you've, you've got a lot of experience at this um so you're right well this is about you so why don't you tell us a bit about your uh you know your your origin with collecting original comic art when you got started sure i mean i I know that you, I mean, I feel like the stories I've heard are that you were on the East Coast at the time when you first started collecting original comic art. Sort of. I, 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 I was, I grew up in New York City. Uh, I shopped basically all my life at the different, you know, New York City, a lot of the Upper West Side comic book stores, originally West Side Comics, and then later uh, uh, Big Apple Comics owned by Pete Koch. Although I, I must have been there every week for seven years and i'm guessing behind the wall the rear wall like pete and albert and like scott dunbeer were back there with comic art none on the wall i had no idea never saw any of them never mm -hmm. met them never saw them but i i get the sense it was right over the wall just right behind that wall um but i was just a you know i was just a comic reader pretty hardcore marvel and dc but i was a comic reader i was a bit of a collector in the sense of I was buying my books and I was, you know, bagging and boarding them. So if anybody needs a copy of the, the Wally West Kid Flash uh, number, uh, not Flash number one, when he becomes the Flash by Mike Barron and Jackson Guys, I've mm -hmm. got like 20 copies of that. They're worth about a nickel. Um, you know, again, that's what comic collecting was sort of in the, you know, 80s and 90s. Um, I had my X-Men books. At some point, I started to fill in other X-Men books. There were books like giant size that I never had enough money in my pocket. You know, I've always joked 
if I had $30, it was 40. If I had 40, it was 50. If I had 50, it was a hundred. I never could afford, I just never had enough to afford it. But I, I loved comic books. I, I kept collecting. My friends collected with me. Then they all sort of fell away and I kept collecting. They, they kind of, uh, you know, to this day, they still have some of their comics, but, and they ask me about it, but they don't, and they care, but they don't care. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a, a comic book guy. I started, I went to a couple of shows in New York. I went to uh, a couple of those, uh, I guess it was the, what was his name? Uh, was it, were they, I think they're like the church shows on 56th yeah. Street. Were those Phil Sulings? I'm not, and I those think were, maybe. Yeah, I think those were Suling shows. Yes. Yeah. Went to one or two of those. Went to a big one that was the big snow one at the Javits Center. I think I saw some art, but I didn't quite know what it was. And I also saw Artist Alley and didn't know the difference that those weren't like some of those people weren't working artists, that some of them were just people drawing those characters. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So the art for me was sort of nothing I ever really thought about. It was really when I moved out to LA, when I started on Seinfeld, the first summer of that, which would have been the summer of 95, I got to go down to my first San Diego. And I went down to my first San Diego and, you know, was sort of blown away, ended up sort of staying. I went down for the day, but ended up staying like the weekend, basically, you know, back when you could just walk up and buy a ticket and get a hotel room and nobody and park just like on the street across the street. But anyway, um, I never went to Super Snipe. He, well, I think he was the part owner. Sorry, I just happened to catch that. I never did. I own... Um, they did a cool uh, uh, set of Joe Johnston and Ralph McQuarrie uh, prints at Super Snipe because of mm -hmm. George Lucas, uh, which I have, but I never went to Super Snipe. That was a uh, far east side, uh, very far from the you west know, side. The funny, yeah. I, Sorry, I thought it was kind of funny the way you mentioned uh, uh, Pete and Albert and Scott behind the wall because that really was what it was like. In the I, I mean, I don't think they were hiding. They it wasn't. No, it just... wasn't an Anne Frank situation. No, no. But they were. But it's just funny, Pete. I shopped in Pete's store for years, and there was not even, not even a framed Xerox that might tell you art i mean i just like like no no nothing i mean i it, it's it, it was sort of when i finally met pete and be kind of you know years later became friends with him and scott it was like it felt perverse in a very funny <laughs> way because i was just like i've been shopping at your store my the store was on 92nd and broadway my grandmother lived on 92nd and broadway i would go to the comic store and go visit my grandmother i was a very good grandson and i did that every saturday for years <laughs> never saw never saw art so just a funny thing but when i went to san diego i i saw my first art i i saw things that i'd never seen before i had a hilarious experience uh at glenn danzig's table where uh he wasn't there but they had he had one of his guys was there and they had the black and white Dark Knight piece, the the the, the poster art, the mm -hmm. the sort of the uh, sort of the torso piece, kind of. I don't know how else to describe it. I'm I'm sure it has a name, but it they had this piece, and I went up. I never. I was like, this is incredible. What what you know? What is this? And it's like I was like, is that an original? Yeah. And I was like, how much? And you know, the guy, some a hole, just kind of went like you know, again, I can't remember the number, but I'll, I think it was, he said something like, you know, eight. And I was just like, eight, eight dollars, eight hundred dollars, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, it was a real, like, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. And it was right. just like, fuck you. <laughs> um, and, well, and I walked away, but I did leave that show with my first real piece of comic art, which actually I bought from Matt Wagner, mm -hmm. which was a piece from his, um, the Two Face storyline with all the freaks. I think it was called Freaks from uh, Legends of the uh, Legends of the Dark Knight. It was a two-parter, almost a little bit. Matt kind of dipping a little bit into that kind of almost like Toth style that he can kind of focus in. It was yeah, a great story, um, two-parter, wonderful. And I bought this just cool page he had, and I think I signed up for his newsletter. But that was my first piece of art, and I was beyond hooked i had i think met tom horvitz at the show who lived in the valley and he had art and so i made plans to go see him and all of this stuff happened and then the following christmas i was in new york city and ended up hooking up with pete who came over to my hotel we were there 
was that then or was that oh i'm sorry a year later sorry a year later I, forgive me a year later i then go back to the i go back to san diego i'm i'm i'm, I'm this would have been now 96 i go back to san diego um I've met Pete, whatever, whatever. But before San Diego, I go to New York on like a, just a Seinfeld. We all went to New York to kind of like absorb the city and get stories and stuff with Jerry after Larry left the show and Jerry was kind of running it without, without Larry. And Pete came over to my hotel room and brought a bunch of stuff that I, you know, to maybe to offer me. And in, in, in that pile was that piece that I hadn't gotten from Danzig. And I bought it for, I gave, I, I, I was, I, I happily gave Pete the money and uh, bought the piece. So it has, was a it 800 happy, or 8,000? It was, I think it was 8,000. And of course, once Pete had it, <laughs> right, I think it was 10,000, but so, so be it. Piece. So no, be it. Yes, knows. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, you got to pay a little bit of a little adjustment, but mm -hmm. again, it was, it was incredible. And again, that was sort of, I was, I was hooked. I was hooked very quickly. So that's, sure. I guess, somewhere in there is an origin story. No, no. Well, uh, it's, uh, you know, you're, you, you got in at an interesting time in the, you know, in the mid nineties, that's, that's about, I started around 98, 99. And, uh, and the, I think the hobby was just starting to change then, but you know, at that point it was sort of where, you know, a lot of the dealers kind of seem to do a lot of trading just with them amongst themselves and with some of the more high profile collectors. But it, it's for when I came even at, it came in at 98, 99, I felt like there was like a barrier for, as a new collector trying to figure out, well, how do I meet Albert Moy to talk to him? Or how do I meet Mike Berkey or who's I, I, I'd see the name Tom Horvitz and, I, and I, I'm like, I don't know. Who oh, that guy hey, is, Tom. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and knowing, you know, Glenn Z Danzig, I mean, do I even want to approach his table, you know, kind of a thing. And it, it was all, uh, it was just, it was an, it was an interesting time. So I think that, you know, you came in. Well, it's interesting. And I don't, again, I don't want to ever put words in people's mouths, but mm -hmm. I, I, I remember talking to Pete and I think it was really, it must've been when the big Tony Christopher sale, which would have been, mm -hmm. I don't know. Somebody in the chat remember when that all went down, um, when Tony well, Christopher sort of, is that, yeah, well, they should someone, know. Someone yeah. will know. Someone will know. But anyway, when that happened, and all of a sudden, like things started like bigger numbers at the time and going in a lot of different directions. I remember that that was when uh, Pete Koch basically felt like for the first time, um, you he wasn't going to be able to get a piece back. And that was a huge change at the mm -hmm. time in the world of comic art that there was, it was always this sense of things were constantly in flux that you could sell a piece to a collector, maybe get it back, trade it to another dealer, do another deal. It would loop around and these pieces would come back. And I guess somewhere in there, and it certainly wasn't just me, but I guess myself and then sort of the people that sort of were with me and behind me a little bit where as people started to spend more money and again, I, I I'm guilty as charged. Um, like basically things started to disappear a little bit, like into collections where you weren't going to get it back. And that it wasn't that you can offer me another one, but I'm not going to give you the first one. I'll just buy the second one also, as mm -hmm. opposed to, I can't, I, I can't get rid of the second, the first, I have to get rid of the first one to get the second one. And right. obviously there are still people that do that all the time, but I, all of a sudden that was a big change. And I, like I said, that felt like it was in the, I'll call it the late nineties from my perspective, but again, people can feel free to uh, disagree with that. But anyway, yeah. So that was sort of the big change. Yeah. All right. Well, back then everybody sort of knew where everything was too, who had what, I mean, it's still a lot of those guys do, but but by and large, I mean, I felt like, you know, there was a tight, tighter reins around the hobby, at least as far as knowing, knowing who the major players were and, who, you know, who had what and where it was. And today it's a lot more difficult as far as, uh, you know, getting in, you know, knowing for sure where something is because of the way uh, collectors are so, uh, you know, we trade, sell artwork sure. all the time. Things are moving around without you uh, being able to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of where, where certain pieces have gone. Uh or was that one thing? I was just somebody had mentioned something earlier. Oh, it was it was Tom. Tom said he grew up in Shaker Heights, uh, ironically. So th nice to have you in the chat, Tom. <laughs> um, but so so moving forward, though, I mean, what you know, because obviously, and I, I mentioned this kind of in the show description. A lot, you know, many of the pieces in your collection are like would be the cornerstone of most people's collections. I mean, you, you've got oh, like some of the thank best you very examples much. from the creators that that I love, and even ones that I don't love. I look at it and I can say. Man, I mean, somebody who's a uh, Brian Bolland collector would just, that would be it. That would they, that would be enough for them. I know it. And and a lot of people can't have that. I mean, so you seem to have had a really good eye 
early on. Knowing- I mean, I, I think I was a little bit at the forefront of, because I was a comedy writer, when people that were my age were still in school or graduate school or working their first jobs, I was lucky enough to be sort of, you know, very well paid first by Saturday Night Live and then Seinfeld. And that 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 is just a fact. I, you know, I, I was, it was what it was. And so I was, you know, I always joke, I was sort of single, living in a rental apartment in Los Angeles, driving a leased car, you know, no wife, no girlfriend, no family, no nothing, working seven days a week, certainly six days a week, but often seven days a week on Seinfeld. And they were feeding us. So I had zero expenses. And so every day, just I would, as I would come out on a break from the, whatever the meeting room, and there would be just pinned up like faxes from, you know, uh, uh, Mitch Itkowitz or whoever, you know what I mean? And, or, oh, yeah. or, or Tom this would have left, back yeah, in the day when yeah that, or Tom would have, Tom would leave me a, a voicemail message at my office phone. And it was just like, are you interested in this? And I would just be like, yeah, I gotta go. I gotta get back in the room, but I'll take it. And then the packages would just kind of show up and, you know, again, for, I, I, I think I, so I, I was a little bit, dare I say, you know, with like certainly burn Miller, a bit of Perez Bolin too. I was the, at the time, the young guy when people did like, like the, they liked them all. It's not like anyone thought dark Knight was bad or anything like that. But again, a dark Knight page might be 600, $700 mm-hmm. at, at the time, which was considered high. But for me at the time, Oh, I'll take them both. That's that's wonderful. I mean, you know, it was one of those sort of yeah, things. Yeah, do yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then, of course, because I paid seven hundred, then all of a sudden the price was eight hundred. But I also kind of went, yeah, okay, I don't care. I'll take that one also. And then mm-hmm. someone else was like, I got to get one of those. I'll give you a thousand. And I went, I will too. Great. And again, I I take responsibility, but. I, I love the stuff and I had nothing else to do with my time. So I bought the stuff that I had, you know, read and loved. It was that simple. Right. But I mean, but you were buying like the best stuff. I mean, if there was a $400 dark, dark night page beside an $800 dark night page, would you buy them both? Or would you only buy the $800 one? Back then I probably bought the $800 one unless it was also from book one. Cause I was obsessed with book one at the time, but, um, but 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 ultimately I did start buying them all. I just I I had at some point I had a very demented idea that I was gonna put a book together somehow. And I was just buying whatever I could find. And you didn't care which grab. book it was. This is, this well, there were, were certain books it. as I was going that mm-hmm. I started to have a preponderance of pages. I had yeah. a lot of not issue four. I had a I, I at first I had a lot of two and three and then a bunch of one. So again, it kind of it came in waves, but and I bought out other collections. There was a big collector in San Diego I bought out. Uh, I bought a lot of stuff from Kevin Eastman. I hope that's okay that I'm saying that at this point. It's been it's a come up million quite a, years. Okay. Kind of has come up a lot yeah. in the conversation. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, and, and, and then it was one of those things where when I put those two collections together, all of a sudden I went, oh my God, this is a consecutive sequence. I have like seven pages in a row, but from two different guys. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, no, I never, someone's asking, I never bought a page directly from Miller. I never met Miller till about, gosh, about like three, four years ago, I met him for the first time. So uh, no, I never really bought from the M- Miller, Burr and Burn. I never bought anything from them directly. It was always secondary or art dealers or whatnot. And like I said, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I actually met uh, Frank Miller in person. And it was only about a couple of years ago. Also, um, it turned out John Byrne was a really, really big Veep fan. And uh, I found that out and I got to sort of email with him about Veep a bit, which was great because I that was a perfect way. I Not, not that it was about my thing, but I just didn't want to be the guy going, I love the X-Men. It was just nice that, you know, we talked about, I don't know, just TV and things. And it was just mm-hmm. kind of nice. Um, I, there are many guys, much like Jimmy, who's on here, that I have bought stuff from the artists themselves. Um, you know, one of the things I used to love about going to shows, you know, especially in the mid late '90s, were those sort of small, slightly smaller shows like the old WonderCon in Oakland, which I loved, where you know I got to know some artists really well there. Um, some of the smaller East Coast shows, and you know, anyway, though that was a really fun chance, and you know, like with with like Jimmy who's on here, I think I put up a, a copy of a copy. I put up a scan. I do a 
for those that care, I do kind of a, a hashtag comic art Mondays, Mondays on, yeah. on social media where mm -hmm. I put up a piece from my collection and sometimes tell a little story about it of some sort. And I put up a, a Daredevil cover uh, uh, by uh, Jimmy and Joe. And uh, I kind of, that's, I met them kind of getting that. They were working with Kevin Smith. I, I, I told a vision, a version of the story. They were working with Kevin. They were trying to get a piece to give him a Frank Miller piece. And I helped them and I got that. And, you know, I, I don't know how one says this, Jimmy and I just sort of stayed in touch and became friends. And, you know, you know, one day he's at my wedding. I mean, it just, again, not, there's no master plan there. It just, you know, you hit it off with some people you don't with others. It is sure. what it is. But so no Frank Miller at my wedding, but yes, thank God, Jimmy Palmiotti. So I'm, I'll take that any day of the week. So there mm -hmm. you go. Yeah. But anyway, that's sort of an answer. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> I was talking with Felix a few months ago. Or, or gosh, I don't even remember. It might have been longer than like eight months ago. But I told him that my dream interview would be to have you and Kevin Smith together uh, on, on an interview. Because Kevin Smith is like one of my biggest heroes for many different reasons. Just because he's a darn funny guy, or incredibly creative. And uh, I can always watch Jay and Silent Bob and get a laugh when I'm, you know, when I'm down. He's he's just been somebody who's been a big part of my my, my life, just enjoying the things that he's done, you know. And I can't say that, like uh, there are many creators where I've like just thoroughly enjoyed absolutely everything that a person has done, and uh, and he's one of them. I mean, from the comic books he's he, written, he's, he's a good, he's a great guy. And I know he, 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 he loves, he loves too, right? all I mean, he loves so, all the same stuff. Yeah, uh, take that as you will. I, I can simply say to you, I'm available. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so i got i'm halfway there i'm halfway michael there. mcisaac you are my favorite person ever there you go you win you win tonight nice. you win tonight's dueling dealers by saying the clerks <laughs> animated series was brilliant thank you um <laughs> yeah the clerks animated. you know i only saw I, I actually haven't seen the whole oh uh, you are missing out my friend i i have a, <laughs> i've been told that and it's one of the few things by that uh kevin was involved with that i haven't seen a lot of but uh andrew Allen, there's not going to be any art it's just going to be free form chat for about four or five hours <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I liked, you know, before we move on, the yeah. one thing that I, I really enjoyed that you said about five minutes ago was that when you were kind of uh, giving the great example of how art prices rise, right? It's like, yep. when, that is, you know, as soon as you buy, you buy two $700 pages that, that other dealers thought were $600 pages. When you come back, they're going to be $800 pages. And then, like you said, a collector comes around, they're going to offer you a thousand because they know they have to, yeah. have to pay to get it. And that's really what makes our market. I mean, you know, that is, that is the, goes, that is the definition of a market. And back mm -hmm. in the old days, and again, I'm an old man. Um, yes, I, uh, Paul, I do have that first piece of art. I still have the Matt Wagner piece. That's you're going to, they're going to bury that one with, uh, with me. Um, but, uh, uh, what I was going to say was, is back in the old days when it was a smaller community and there was no eBay and there was, you know, there was no heritage and there was still, there was Christie's and Sotheby's doing auctions and whatnot, mm -hmm. but it was smaller. And so you could watch the price increases and you knew who was responsible. I mean, you know, back in the day, and again, you can, you know, I think those of us that were around can kind of remember them, you know, it was like, you know, what M Mike Berkey sort of had a hand in the Ramita art. Sure. Um, but then I can also remember the other guys like the I, uh, God names. I haven't thought of in a long time, like, like Aaron Sultan desperately trying to out to, he was going to pay whatever to get a good page that Mike didn't get. And so mm -hmm. that's how those markets were created. And I definitely, I don't necessarily know all the people with the Miller stuff, but certainly I was involved in the Miller stuff. Um, on the burn side, there was uh, Will Gabriel, Wayne Osborne, myself. Those were three guys that were definitely inching that up. And there were others too. I don't mean to leave anyone out, but there was definitely that kind of stuff going on where I, we could kind of semi identify who is responsible. Whereas nowadays <laughs> it's a little harder. Do you know what I mean? Where you just, oh, yeah. you come in, you see a price and I'm you, most of the time you'd like to think there's a reason something has a price, which is X sold for Y, you know, yesterday. So this is now the new price, but Back then, we could usually go, yeah, I know exactly why that is, and it's my fault. So it was a different, again, a different time. Right. Well, it's like, and that's something I had a conversation with a collector recently who was like, there's a new buyer going after things that I really like, and it's driving me crazy because, you know, he's overspending and it's going to push the market up. And, uh, you know, even if it's like you said, if it's at a $2,000 level or a $20,000 yeah. level, that's all it takes to kind of 
give everything a, a, you know, goose things along even further. You can look at Heritage Auction or Comic Link Auction, and that might be an outlier piece that reached a price you don't think should have been there. But, but when you have a few collectors in there that are willing to overpay, sometimes uh, that just sets sets a new threshold for that market, and that's that's you know that's how our hobby grows i mean at the end of the day or doesn't grow or your collection doesn't get yeah. any larger because of those prices but uh i'm going to answer a quick question just because it was a cool sure. one from samuel rojas does david have a prized art piece that isn't comic related um i have a uh an incredible piece that i love um for many reasons uh art reasons certainly um I have a uh, a comp piece by Norman Rockwell for wow. his famous jester painting that is sort of the sad jester. And uh, for all the obvious reasons, as a clinically depressed comedy writer, um, you know, that's that 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 piece just speaks to me for a million reasons. So that would be uh, a non comic art, I guess, uh, illustration art. Oh, my God, Stephanie Kennedy. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, costume uh, d designer for Seinfeld. Am I allowed to say that, Stephanie? I hope so. Um, <laughs> Back in biz. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> she but used to be she was she was a big or maybe still is like, stephanie do you still collect the poster art uh not poster art, but poster movie posters anyway big uh, movie poster collector anyway sorry that wasn't <laughs> you know that, that's stephanie. Before my time yeah. you know with the, with the faxing and everything but i knew or i've heard well you that, knew there were fax machines yes bill <laughs> right i knew there were fax machines but i didn't know about how like you mentioned it, mitch uh who was faxing out stuff to you know lists of art for sale i mean that was just but with me, it, it wasn't my mind that, in know, my, I don't know what Mitch was doing for everybody, but if he got a piece that he thought I would want, and mm -hmm. I think Tom, you might've done it too, other people as well. He would literally just like Xerox the piece, get it down to like a, you know, page size and then sort of send me the piece sometimes with just like a hand scribbled note, interested mm -hmm. question mark. And I would go on my break. It would be pinned to my door. I would take it down, go in, dial up and just go, yes, I'll take it. He already had my credit card number. He knew the mailing address and that was that. And I just was like, you know, or sometimes I leave him a voicemail. I got to go back into a meeting. I'll take it. You know, it would be like that. It was really funny. <laughs> Oh, uh, the good old days, right? Before text messages and, e and email, right? Free I, I, eBay, but that's free the, eBay. Oh, but I've yeah. heard these stories before. I heard, I mean, Albert yeah. used to do that where he would, he would, uh, you know, get a photocopy of something and fax it off yeah. just so he could see if you, you know, if, if he thought you'd want it, that's what yeah. he did. And it's just, you know, again, that's, that's before my time, but, it, but it just shows you that, you know, the, the desire to move pieces, I mean, you know, and accommodate clients, we're, we're always there with art dealers. I mean, even more so now, every, you know, like you said, if they know you well enough, which pieces, you know, you may want to buy. So now they just pick up the phone, they shoot you a text, they can text, you know, they can send you, they're, they're still aggressive at uh, marketing and it's a good thing. It's, you know, it's, this, our, our hobby is small enough that guys who are selling the art at least can, you know, can get to they know what you want, and that if they can, uh, if they have a consignment piece, it's easy for them to 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 turn it to somebody else, right? I sure. Mean, it's it, and it's like look again, it's I'm not, I don't, I, you know again, it's it's all now you know many many years ago, but I, again, I'm not trying to. I don't want to. I, I I don't want it to sound like a weird you know bragging of any sort, but at the time. If somebody got a good Miller piece, even if I didn't know them, they would try and find my phone number or email or whatever and say, you don't know me, but I have this Miller piece. Because whether they knew my name or not, it was like the Seinfeld guy buying Miller Dark Knight. So it was there was a, there was that was a moment in time very long ago, but it was a moment in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, James Henderson. Would like you to uh, post that Rockwell. <laughs> Get right on that, James. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, Carlos is asking about that uh, an X Men sale for Jim Lee artwork. I, I actually don't know, Carlos. I'd have to ask Tatiana if that if that happened or not. I don't. I don't know if that. Uh, oh, that double page. That that double page. Uh, I have yeah. no idea. I don't know. Yeah. Yep, I'm not familiar if it did yeah. or not. We haven't chatted with them since I did the interview with them. Um, 
let's see uh what other questions were here someone wanted to know uh, uh favorite artist i mean is it I, well i don't want to put words in your mouth who if you oh, had a favorite I, artist, can, so you, can you actually hard. even name a single no artist? i can't i can name a bunch i mean again i'm not i'm not trying to be coy or anything like that it's just too hard i mean i can name my favorite books and my books are connected to my favorite artists and obviously frank miller is one of them uh certainly um i mean i've named you know i've, I've sort of named a bunch of them you know mm -hmm. for me I really, you know, as because again, I was born in 1970. So that that sort of tells you everything you need to know. So Star Wars, when I was seven years old, that's sort of touchstone number one. And then uh, hold on one second. Yeah, bud. Oh, what's up? Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, I, and uh, so Star, Star Wars, very important. And then certainly into comics. Um, burn x-men but that also means cockroom x-men it also means paul smith x-men it means john romita jr x-men it you know because i i was a lot i just i read x-men you know forever so mm -hmm. all the major x-men artists um perez titans especially um okay. and then oh i yeah. got a good question for you yeah, we did the show, we did a show once on our t on top five x-men artists can you name your top five x-men artists me in in order if possible oh god i certainly don't think i can name them in order well i'm sorry i'm sorry everybody because i love you all uh john Byrne, terry austin number one that's that's just that's just number one i'm sorry it just that was that was that was the perfection it you know it just it doesn't get better than that mm -hmm. um i'll probably go for me cockrum 2 paul and again with various inkers but especially terry austin on him mm -hmm. um three paul smith don't forget paul smith just we're doing it, yeah we're, we're, just, we're in the yeah. same area right here right? yeah so no far. again i i'm 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 a cliche because i'm i'm just my no. age group you know what i mean yes marcus andy kubert is wonderful but again he's making me do top five and it's just going to be those guys that were working together in there so my, then i'm going to go jrjr for especially that first run where you know just those books were just so so wonderful and i love it um and then i'll probably jump uh you'd think i was going to go jim lee although i do love jim lee also but oddly uh uh, I'm going to, oh, see, now I'm thinking to myself, like, I feel like I got to be putting Arthur Adams on this list and to some extent Mignola too, who didn't do a lot of X-Men, but those classic X-Men, anyway, it's impossible. It's it's impossible. Point, yeah, pointless. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. But that's, that's how you can tell what age I am. And yes, of course, I'm just seeing Kirby, Neil Adams, Steranko. Of course, of course, of course. It's just right. They're all my great, age, all what I, yet. what I bought on the stands, what I was first obsessed with. That's mm -hmm. what I was obsessed with. So, yeah. I ended up, uh, well, your first three were mine. I also, I put Neil Adams in there because I thought he came out of the He's book when- incredible. You know, I mean, I, the, the Havoc costume to me is one of the single greatest piece of like design work mm -hmm. just ever, 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 ever. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my, I ended up putting Jim Lee as my, my fifth just because of his- contributions to the book i mean i felt like i, I, I love the five. books and again please you know again this one man's opinion though the stories don't hold up for me in mm -hmm. quite the same way to me just to be really clear to sure. me it's not a criticism of them i don't have the fondness for them that i do for the earlier claremont sort of you know whatever you want to call it 94 through certainly 220 or so somewhere in there that's that's the sweet spot so mm -hmm. take that as you will leonardi wonderful yes absolutely again everybody's so upset that i didn't name people <laughs> <laughs> you can't name them all i mean no I, I, frank quietly great x-men artist i love him i mean again you i can name other people i think the people on it right now rb silva fantastic again that just you i was asked my top five everyone calm down yes <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> see you would have been good on that episode that's but we had a lot of fun with it because it's something that uh you know those kinds of things get debated all the time right and yeah. so it was, it was an interesting conversation because we had four people pitch pitch their top fives and none of them matched but it yeah was of course not to kind of see what you, you know yeah so you know we probably should start looking at smart we're we're actually at the one hour point here and we haven't really uh 
<laughs> Nick Patera said he, he can die happy now, probably because you mentioned Frank Quietly being. Uh, <laughs> uh, Quietly is one of my favorites too. But Nick didn't. gets a dollar every time Frank's name gets mentioned on the <laughs> internet, so that's a pretty sweet deal he's worked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So uh, and yeah, hey, and I, I did like Werner Roth. I said Werner Roth would have been up there for me because I mean he worked on the book when nobody else would, right? I mean he he what he he probably did like 30, 30 issues. I mean back at a time when you know that we're we're just lucky the book was still in existence. So uh, so Werner Roth yeah. plays a role definitely even in the history of uh, of the X Men books certainly. Uh, all right, well let's look, I want we got to look at artwork because I I think people are just going to be impressed by the pieces you've picked because like i said they are not the pieces i think everybody would have thought you would have picked um but let's and and this is they're actually just in a, in a random order so i hope that that's okay with you dave yeah i have no, there was no order to i think i sent them to you in semi-alphabetical order but also alphabetical perhaps by the first name which is not really that might be the, how yeah. I ended up doing them yeah. as well. okay well that's fine too yeah all right <laughs> Yay! It's that it should start with ambush bug. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is uh action comics. Um, was it 565? Maybe is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? I it's one of those 560s. Correct, yeah. Um, this is a piece that kind of again, sort of for me, kind of a dual meaning. Um, ambush bug, especially those early appearances, even really before the ambush bug miniseries, I will put up there as some of the funniest absolutely funniest stuff ever allowed to be done uh in comics and these were real important building blocks for me honestly just as a as a comedy writer and to the extent i have dipped my toe into a little bit of comic book writing which has been in the couple of cases i've done it um i uh I, uh, it's always, you know, sort of, if you will, humorous stories. Uh, and uh, I blame Keith Giffen 100%. Uh, I was a huge fan of his Justice League run. But again, Ambush Bug, those early miniseries, but those early appearances of him popping up in action and DC Comics Presents were my absolute favorite. Um, and a bunch of these came from, uh, I want to say, I think these all came from uh, Tom Horvitz, who's on here, actually helped get me these, I believe, from Eric Stevenson when I think at a dark period of time in Image Comics, like when they were having like sort of financial issues, he had this incredible uh, ambush bug collection and uh, and basically, some, you know, sadly thank you michael um sadly sold them off uh through tom to me and i grabbed every one of them i could and i'm still looking uh for them and more of them and all of that uh i did not marcus uh get offered any ambush bug pages from the donnelly's lately but you can let me know if there's a good one that i should be asking them about um but uh or is that more i don't know maybe there's a, a different joke in there um but anyway um I, 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 I'm a huge Keith Giffen fan. I was a huge Legion of Superheroes fan, both when he was working with Paul Levitz and then the five years after that he did himself with, uh, well, I shouldn't say himself, that he did with uh, Tom and Mary Bierbaum. So I was a huge Legion fan. I'm a huge fan of his style. I loved this sort of thicker line ink. I know he got into a little bit of trouble with, I think it was Jose, Spanish artist, Munoz maybe where there was a whole to do thing there but I loved ambush bug I loved the breaking of the fourth wall uh just uh just just my favorite and again this one for me as much about comic art but also about my career Munoz thank you very much Robert Berman uh so uh, for me, this is a piece that kind of transcends, although I did read this on the stands and I did love it. It's also very much about sort of, I guess, honestly, who I am and my, 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 my job. So, yeah. Well, I, ha I hate to say it. I, I actually have never re read any ambush bug. Whatsoever. I, if you didn't read it, I, I have no idea. I'd like to say to you, Oh, read it. You're going to love it. But I couldn't even begin to tell you if it will even resonate so much of it at the time was in a weird way. And again, this is pre-John Byrne reinvention of Superman. Mm -hmm. But this is Julie Schwartz, from what I got the sense of, realizing how Superman is not working and how boring Superman is and how boring action comics had become and kind of purposely saying to Keith Giffen, do what you want, shake it up and go crazy. And 
they're like nothing else. There, there's an anarchy on the pages that I, 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 I and again, I, I put covers up, um, but I put that cover up, but the, the pages themselves with just people falling through panels and again, breaking the fourth wall, as I said, and weird appearances and whatnot. I, it's hard to explain, but it, it's pure anarchy and I, 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 I do love it. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just great. Uh, yeah, just wonderful. I've always loved Giffen's work, though, so I'll, I'll check it out. I yeah. will definitely give it a read. Uh, Aranga wanted to know if there are any um, regular, if, you, if you're still reading comics today. I go, I, I was about to say I go every week, but I actually don't, I, I guess post-COVID, I don't, I try not to go in places if I can avoid it. Um, but uh, I I get books every week from uh, uh, the wonderful Golden Apple Comics, from Big Apple, Pete Koch's store in New York City, to now Golden Apple, uh, the Leibowitz family store uh, here in L.A., and uh, I get comics. I, I buy comics every week. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of new guys that I'm buying and uh, both that I'm reading, liking, and then occasionally buying. Um, I think I saw Felix is in here. Yeah. Uh, oh, maybe Felix, did you pay Aranga to, to ask this question? Because <laughs> many of the gentlemen that I am uh, buying, uh, <laughs> Felix knows the answer, are Felix clients, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson. I loved uh, Beta Ray Bill was a biggie. Oh, yeah. uh, Sanford Green is a newer guy that I sort of have come to really dig. Um, and I picked up uh, is his book. Oh, forgive me. I'm such an idiot. Is it is his bitter root? Am I somebody? Please tell me I'm saying I'm is that am I getting my books mixed up? Um, but also he started sure. doing stuff for Marvel and he's just fantastic. Um, uh, I, who else have I mentioned lately? Um I really like, there's a piece coming up. I don't know if you want to jump to it. Um, the, the, the Mr. Mir did I give you the Mr. Miracle? Did I give the Mr. Miracle um, piece? Was that a piece I, I included? You did. Let me see which number that was. I don't know. My... We're jumping around, but uh, if we're talking new art. We can use it as an example. Is it my ruining this by jumping around? No, no, I, not okay. at all. I'm just trying to spot which one it was. Oh, oh, sure, oh I yeah. Do you see it? I do see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. sorry. We're jumping around, but to an example um, this is, uh, I don't actually remember the issue number. I'm sure Felix knows because it is another one of his guys. Um, this was the cover to the Tom King, uh, uh, the Tom King, uh, no, sadly, uh, I think Mitch Gerard's is great. His interiors, I guess were all computer stuff. And I guess now he's doing one of ones, but I'm sorry, I'm not interested in that. So these covers are by, uh, uh, was it, uh, uh, Darrington, yes, uh, and uh, uh, I just I, I love these covers. Uh, I I am very much uh, to this day for me it is about the story as much as the art. What I mean mm -hmm. by that is, and this is not about this piece. Um, uh, what I was going to say is, is I can love a bad piece of art or a quote unquote lesser artist from if the story is great. I don't care. And if you give me a great piece of art, I can appreciate it. But if the story is terrible, I'm probably not going to be the piece for me. Um, that's just me. And so uh, Tom King has done a whole bunch of stuff that I've loved, but in particular, uh, this Mr. Miracle stuff. And I also picked up a bunch of Walter pages uh, from the vision stuff that Tom King wrote, who I think is just doing just some of my favorite stuff right now. And so that's an explanation. Um, Mitch did a piece that I didn't give to, uh, to put up, uh, but I, he did a piece. There's the, forgive me, the Batman Catwoman special that came out that was supposed to be John Paul Leone, but then he passed away and a whole bunch of artists got together to help them finish the book for John Paul Leone. And Mitch did a piece in that that I got of Catwoman sort of at Bruce's grave that I, 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 I is just fantastic. Again, another Tom King book. So again, for me, it's always going to be about the interior and yes, exactly. Michael Perlman saying Mitch did traditional art on the Batcat special. And I grabbed a page, um, uh, uh, you know, instantly because I do like Mitch's stuff a lot. Um, anyway, I, somewhere in there is an answer. So yes, I am reading every week. I'm still reading X-Men and other things that have been reading forever. And I pick up new stuff, you know, literally all the time. Uh, this last Saturday, I literally, uh, 
uh, Brian K. Vaughn, who does this wonderful uh, sub stack where he's got his new book that, of course, I can't remember any names of anything, but there's lots of people that are going to say the names of it while we're here because I can't remember. And Spectators, I just remember. Did I win? Um, anyway, Spectators is his book. And um, he also in his Substack will sometimes write about just like, you know, like stuff in general. And he was writing about a couple of new stores in Burbank. And so this last Saturday, my son and I just drove around to some of these new stores that I didn't even know were in Burbank uh, and just went to these new stores and just, you know, pick something up that I, you know, here and there that I hadn't seen. So anyway, yes, I do read new stuff. It's not all Miller and Burns. So there you go. Ha ha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so you, you have to, uh, you know, suffer a Felix comic art drop, and you have to get in there with the rest of us and and fight for your. For your uh, yeah, but that's okay. I don't mind. Uh, it, you know, one of the things about new artists, I will simply say, in a world where, you know, if I land one piece on my master list of what I'm looking for, if I land mm -hmm. one good piece a year, that's a great. What's the word I'm looking for? That's a that's an amazing accomplishment. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh yeah. But I love comics and I love comic art. And so having some guys that are newer, and there are other people too. And by the way, things like Ambush Bug, which isn't new, but perhaps let's just simply say slightly less in demand, having those things that you also love allow me to keep collecting so that I'm not just like sitting there for 364 days a year, just going, this sucks. And then all of a sudden, Oh, look, there's a Miller piece or whatever. So sure. um, one of the many things I like about both new art, but also art that I'm interested in that nobody else cares about. Um, I think I may have told this story somewhere. So forgive me. Uh, I recently picked up a piece that I've been trying to, I've been wanting one forever. And it just became one of those things where yes, people still like it who like it, but most of the, What's the word I'm looking for? The market and a lot of the new writer, the, I'm sorry, the new collectors don't care as much about, but I loved um, Mike Grell's Sable Run. And mm -hmm. there was a cover that I had always loved and uh, an older collector who had it. And I reached out to him and I had asked him about it like 15 years ago. And I was like, I'm sorry to bug you again. And he laughed because he was like, bug me. You haven't mentioned this in 15 years. And I was just like, do you care as much anymore? And he was like, I do not. And I offered him a number, which was very reasonable. And I got it. And I, my Mike Grell Sable cover is one of the best things I picked up, uh, you know, in the last five years of my mm -hmm. collecting, because that's what I wanted. And yes, Felix is in there. I fight it out. And that's exciting. It's exciting to fight it out. And like everybody else, the first time I thought I'd won 40 pieces and then discovered, oh, I see, you get an email that tells you, no, you won <laughs> one of them. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> see, Rich, Rich yeah. says the uh, ambush bug market just got very in demand. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, Ray Cuthbert, the one I got was all black and white, so I, I don't have that answer. I don't love hand coloring personally in general, but the one I got... Uh, the one I got was not, so uh, I was okay with that. Sorry, answering more questions. I apologize. <laughs> and, uh, no, and it's good you pointed that out because uh, Ray's watching on Facebook, and so the people who are watching YouTube Live don't don't see that. So I should, I'm glad. Oh, you didn't that know. way I can highlight. Hi, it Ray. So you can see it. Uh, yeah, Ray, no, no. Ray was collecting when I started collecting. Well, he, he's another one of the the the, the old timers Ray, like exactly. me. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I had Ray on a long time ago. Yeah, Ray. Ray's uh, he's he's been around a little while, but. And, and he's got a spectacular collection of original art. I mean, I've, oh, incredible! Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of one of the uh, collections. I mean, there's a lot of collections I admire on Cap. But Ray's is definitely one of them. Yours, of course. But um, but yeah, well, might as well. You know, we got to keep looking at art, though. But I, I'm glad that uh, Aranga asked that question because I think that even for me, there, I I don't read as much as I should, but I do love picking up new art when I can. It's uh, it's uh, I think it's really important to. Um, to just kind of support those things and today's it's 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 just a different uh it, it's a, it's a real cool opportunity to pick Did up brian ketterer thing. just pay me a hundred dollars for this this is incredible he, he, well he's made a donation <laughs> let's see i'm sorry brian ketterer, do i uh, get how what do i get of that bill uh, we, we, we forgot to pre-negotiate we, we oh, well, you lunch. know what you keep yeah. it you keep it we can go out for lunch at san diego how's that put it to comic art fans <laughs> please uh but thank you so much uh, thank you brian, brian. <laughs> yep, this is uh, it is uh, this is a great interview. Did I, I just win agree. dueling dealers with an offer of a hundred dollars? Did I win? 
Is that how this works? I don't understand. No, no, that's not no? How it Okay, works. we'll it's... keep going. But but I'm, I'm gonna not... beat Anthony. Anyway, go on. <laughs> well, it's not hard. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Hopefully, Anthony's not watching. I'm not trying to pick on him either. But um, but all right. Well, let's let's. Uh, well, this next piece is pretty spectacular. So I, I, let's highlight this one here from by Arthur Adams. From X Men Annual Nine. This, so, yeah. uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm a huge yeah. Arthur fan. For anyone who has seen my um, CAF, uh, I, Arthur is one of the more complete sort of listings of stuff. There's, and there's, there is other stuff too. There's newer stuff, but he's a guy that I guess I just sort of somehow when I first got on. Uh, CAF, I was sort of putting a lot of his stuff up for fun because uh, he's someone uh, he and his wife Joyce I uh, became friends with. Um, so he's a friend, but I just, I love the stuff. He was for me like a new guy that sort of started drawing like after I was, hey, Anthony, uh, I'm going to beat you in whatever this is, dueling whatever's. Um, but uh, I, I, uh, so Arthur for me was like a new guy, which is just like, makes me so goddamn old. Um, this is an incredible piece, obviously from the Asgardian stories this is from the annual nine. It's inked by Simonson, which is just incredible. And you can see the Simonson. I see it in sp certain places. I obviously the gargoyle and the building detail right up front there. I see it in the wings, in that horn, you know, on the building there in the upper, in the upper right. So you're seeing, uh, you know, I, I see the detail in a lot of those places that it's just wonderful. Um, I also, this is a pretty great story, if I may say so myself. Oddly, a lot of wedding stories tonight. Um, Simon Powell, a longtime collector and very good friend. This was actually a wedding gift uh, to me and my wife, possibly her least favorite wedding gift, possibly my favorite, uh, most favorite <laughs> wedding gift. Um, but this was something from his collection that uh, that he gave us, parentheses, uh, me. Uh, and I, I'm always very quite touched by that and uh, love the piece, love that storyline, love everything about it. So uh, just... Uh, I thought it'd be a good one. And, I, and, and, and it represents, um, for me, all the Arthur pieces in my collection, but this was one I wanted to sort of, uh, you know, sort of give a shout out to. That's amazing. I mean, as a combination of creators, it's, it's, it's unlikely, but it, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And, uh, nope. I, this again, like I said, this is, I look at this piece and it's like, this would be like the, the piece for me. If I could own a uh, work by Art, Art Adams and Simonson, I mean, this this would be it for for both creators. I wouldn't need to get another example. It's it's just that good. Simon loves weddings for Larry Tun. Just FYI, he's a real sucker for uh, weddings. So if you're if you're thinking about getting married, <laughs> I see uh, that. Yeah, get to get to know him. Um, no, uh, it was uh, it was it was an, it, we had just enough comic and we had, we certainly had we had a couple of tables of some of comic art collectors and artists and people um, uh, as has been discussed here. Um, there was uh, this was a wedding gift uh, and uh, and James Jean did our ketuba. That's in my CAF oh gallery. My. You can check out our ketuba. So a little bit of comic art and you can you can work comic art into your wedding. You can, it's it's doable. Uh, that's my new book that's coming out soon. Um, but. Uh, Oh, hey, there you are, Anthony. I think we did that in your, uh, was that your old apartment? I honestly, it's so long ago. It's so long ago. I've known Anthony forever. Um, anyway, uh, yes. What else? Sorry. All right. Oh, no, I mean, uh, so I'm, I, hey, Anthony, I kind of figured you were in the, in the audience. So that was only a tongue in cheek saying you're easy to, uh, to, to defeat on dueling dealers. All right. We got a show tomorrow night. We got to do, so don't get mad at me. <laughs> uh let's see here what do we got next oh uh somebody men mentioned chris chris's art earlier and this is a yeah this, this actually will tie in a lot of things people brought up chris um i thought chris was truly one of the great uh x-men artists this was from the the steve siegel run which was a little bit aborted i thought it was really interesting but if memory serves there's a lot of I don't know what the word is these days, editorial interference where it sort of didn't become, I think, what they wanted to. But this is um, Chris inked by Tim Townsend. Um, and I got this from Tim and I actually picked it. And we, I know we talked a little bit about Tim earlier. I picked this piece um, because it's a great X-Men piece. I love it. I love Chris. Maybe it's not where people think of him. Obviously, people death is a biggie for them, although maybe they think about X-Men. I thought this was a definitive version of the 
original classic X-Men team as they looked at this point in time. Uh, Tim had inked it. It was a piece he was keeping for himself. I loved it. We ended up working out. We did a trade. I traded him. Uh, I had a Travis Charest uh, Wildcats piece, the one of uh, Voodoo, where she's sort of like in like the lizard costume. I, I it's been too long. Uh, Damonite oh, yeah, no costume. Sorry, about. Damonite sure. costume. Uh -huh. Wow, I can't believe I remember the word Damonite. And uh, and uh, uh, we did a trade, and I just this was I I I love this piece and. Uh, and it just, uh, again, uh, it speaks to X-Men is a book that I have just been reading. I, I did stop for a little while in there when the young X-Men were back and uh, didn't care for that at all. But I definitely almost have been reading X-Men nonstop since basically uh, X-Men 138. So there you go, uh, including including to this day. Uh, and I have representations of all different uh, X-Men artists. We were talking about different X-Men artists. This is my Chris Timpey's. I, like I said, I thought this was a very definitive version uh, of these guys from a very sort of underrated little run by uh, Siegel. So anyway, that's my spiel. No, thank, thank you, Tim Townsend, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've always enjoyed seeing, you know, I like when X-Factor came out. So I always like seeing the classic uh, lineup, you know, done by different guys. So this is, this is a, I remember when this issue came out, I mean, this is just a phenomenal. And cover. yeah. And I, and I will say, and again, I, I love Chris. I know Chris a little bit. I, I certainly love Tim. I will simply say this to me is a piece of, you can tell that there were no deadline issues. There was no nothing. Everybody's sort of working. You know, Tim got to ink the whole thing. Chris kind of like got to really, you know, do a really interesting layout that uses, you know, both, negative space and to make the the main characters pop it just it to me it really works and the the different line weights that tim brings to it really make the characters pop in front of a somewhat complicated like sort of whatever's going on behind them but not i don't know it, this is what i love about it so there you go switching gears here a little bit but uh uh, a ball in the Camelot 3000 cover. Yeah, I had put up the cover to uh, Camelot 3001 a couple of weeks ago as mm -hmm. part of my uh, uh, Comic Art Mondays. Um, and I thought I'd put this one up just to put another uh, Bolland up. Um, I, I do, uh, or Bolland, I should say, as the proper pronunciation, as Joseph Melkier has taught me. Right. Um, I, this book for me, obviously DC Comics, but at the time, this was really opened my eyes to a lot of, I guess, sci-fi and possibilities the idea of again what seems like now a no-brainer but the idea of sort of oh it's king arthur but in the future and all of that kind of stuff you know again got start getting me into sci-fi and whatnot i was able to buy these a couple of years ago um from bolland himself through a uh joe oh i'm not gonna remember his last name uh Joe, anybody remember who was sort of helping him sell stuff back in the day? Someone else might yell in there. Um, I was a huge Mike Barr fan of his writing. I loved his run on Detective also. Uh, but uh, I just thought this was, this was, I just loved this story. And like I said, it opened me up to a lot of sci fi and stuff. And I just, for me, again, not that it was quote unquote a mature comic, not Manorino, but thank you, Michael. Very funny <laughs> though. Right. Um, but uh, a British bloke, I believe, uh, Joe Prado. Yes, I believe that is it. I think he's British, not Melchior either. Sorry. I think that's Joe Prado who did his own comic dark horizon or something like that. Does that sound hmm. like it's ringing a bell? Maybe Felix, you'll remember anyway. Um, I, again, for me, this was where comics, I, I don't remember the exact year here, but this is where comics to me start to change and things like Camelot 3000 open me up to again, not just sci-fi stuff, but again, the things that like Miller would start to do and all of that kind of stuff. And not only, and these prestige books, but also these sort of, again, I hate to use the word mature because I don't just mean, oh, there was a sexy lady on the cover. I just mean sort of more adult storytelling and kind of what comics could be. And then obviously I, I don't, I, I sound silly sort of extolling the virtues of Bolland, but I mean, 
how does a human hand do this? I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no whiteout on this at all. Look at, I mean, I know it's easy to look at the lady, but look at the goddamn curtain behind her. Look at the, just look at the detail in some of the props around her, the, the monkey, the, the, whatever the, the, that, the, the, the crystal ball, but also the, the stand of the crystal ball. I mean, look at that detail. It's, it's, it's insane. Just, just, just insane. Uh, so anyway. No, I agree. I mean, it's just, it, it is, it would be a dream for me to, to own something by him at all. And, uh, but that's a great example. And it, it's funny. I mean, like you said, I mean, when you're looking at it, you know, you really, you appreciate the work in the drapery behind them and not just the characters. There's so much there to enjoy that uh, you can look at that piece over and over again and probably find something, you know, that you didn't notice before, something that you, you, you know, you appreciate. And, uh, and I, and that. I hope what's coming through. And again, I'm trying, this is why I sort of try. I mean, again, I could probably do this for probably every piece in my collection, dare I say, but it, it's the piece and it is the art. It's all of those things, but it's the book, but also what the book meant to me at the time, how I think about that book now, I, the experience. I remember I, I wrote about this a little bit and other people remembered it too. Issue 12, never coming out. Issue 12, crazily delayed. I mean, I will never forget not, issue 12, not coming out. And when the double issue finally came out, I had a misprint copy. So mm -hmm. I'm reading the book and then all of a sudden it just jumps to the end. And I kind of had the end twice in the book. <laughs> and it was just like, I waited, like, it felt like I'd waited two years for this final issue. I get the book and I still don't, I like, I now I kind of know how it end ends, but it doesn't make any sense because there's a weird alien or something. And I'm just yeah. like, what the, what the F is happening? And I then had to go back to the store and get another copy. Um, and then of course I had to slab that error copy and get it, you know, graded at, you know, at nine point eight error copy and mm -hmm. sell that for a million dollars so i was a busy person so there you go yeah <laughs> uh we're gonna switch gears on this next piece too because now we're going back to marvel and avengers cover by uh busema um I, this is one i've definitely i think people knew i had this this is uh you know again how how one finds these things and kind of you know why we like what we like so I was reading the uh, Roy Thomas, John Buscema Avengers starting right around when, uh, when vision joins the team. So whatever that, whatever that magical issue was um, a couple of issues before this. Um, but I was reading it all in reprints. I was reading it in, I can't, it wasn't Marvel tales. I think it was Marvel super action or something like that. Uh, yeah. Marvel tales was Spider-Man reprints. And it was like Marvel Super Action or Marvel Triple Action or had a name like that or whatever. But I was reading these reprints and I, when I was a little kid, I didn't even know I was reading the reprints. This is true about, thank you, my, my, uh, Rich, uh, uh, Marvel Triple Action. I, when I first was reading X-Men, I was reading those in the Amazing Adventures reprints and I was reading the original Kirby X-Men, the early you know issues. I think I, the first one I ever bought was the one with the blob. And then I was reading those and Unis or Eunice, however you pronounce it, the untouchable mm -hmm. and then the brotherhood and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know I was reading reprints. I didn't think I was buying collectibles. I just was buying stories. I was a kid buying stories, uh, you know, uh, off the newsstand. And then one day I saw the, you know, the, the ad, the, like the old X-Men, you'll love the new X-Men with peace, which I have in my, my, my gallery. Um, and I didn't show tonight cause I've talked so much about that, but that's I was so this is one where I didn't read this on the stand, but I was reading the Marvel triple action. And I love this period of the Avengers. I love this again, you know, just from a, the Avengers storyline. I like sort of the what's the word I'm looking for? The sort of this depowered Avengers, these sort of, you know, these lesser Avengers, if you will. Sure. But Vision was just so cool. But then the whole psychodrama with, you know, Hank Pym, which then played out years and years down the line. I actually have in my gallery, uh, you can see I have one of the Al Milgram covers for when Hank Pym later on, you know, hits uh, the Wasp and goes on trial and all of that kind of stuff. And so, again, seeds that were planted, you know, in 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 19, you know, whatever, whatever this was, 19, I don't know, 60s, late 60s, uh, but issue 59 that, you know, paid off, you know whatever, 200 issues later. Um, I, you know, just, this is Roy Thomas's best storytelling. I love, uh, some say the world, the world will end in whatever fire I say it will end in frost, all of that <laughs> stuff. I love this John Buscema, 
Um, just, uh, it's just, just no one did. I mean, he just, the energy, the, the figures, I, I just, yes, uh, prime exactly. Rich Cirillo, you're, you're taking all the words out of my mouth. I, I just, I love it. And this is a, just a, just such an early great memory for me of reading this. So again, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the what and the why. See, and again, it's like, everything's a perfect example. I mean, I, you just, you, you blow me away, David, you know, whenever, whenever I browse in, in, into your calf gallery, it's Oh, just thank you. Perfect. Hey, I'm just jumping in here, Ray. I am a huge fan. I, I love him on Buscema. And then I, am I crazy? But I, did he ink, uh, did he ink Kurt Swan also? Am I losing my mind there? I can't, now I'm, now I'm getting, everything is blurring uh, a little bit, but I, I, uh, I, just fantastic. Uh, and a him on Busem is incredible. Mm -hmm. Nope. I would agree with you there too. Um, we'll see. Da, da, da. I'm just making sure I missed yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but, but yeah, but yeah, but again, uh, sorry, George Klein. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, you know, when, when you think of artists and titles, I mean, do you say I, there's, there you go. He did ink. I'm not losing my mind. He did ink oh, uh, okay. Swan. And I think Swan Klein, obviously Swan Anderson, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But mm -hmm. I thought he was just very true and wonderful to Kurt Swan and very definitive Superman. I, 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 I love, uh, I have some Swan Klein. I, I love that stuff. So anyway, that's another area I like. Uh, and again, those were things I was reading, obviously not on the stand, but I was reading a lot of that stuff in, uh, at summer camp in like DC digest where they would always be reprinting like the sixties stuff. And then those big hard covers, um, uh, you know, Superman from the thirties to the seventies. And so I was always reading those, the treasury size, all those mm -hmm. things that were re reprinting all of that wonderful, you know, Superman, red, blue, all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, I'm a huge Swan fan as well. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. And bizarro, obviously. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> My my question for you with relation to uh, John Buscema, right? Yes, now, sorry. That's an incredible <laughs> example, Avengers example. I mean, but do you have other examples by John that you you like more, just because of the story or the characters, or, or, or you know, oddly, I have a couple of those covers in a row, those Avengers covers in a okay. row, and I just love them. I love, love them. them I love them. I love them. And um, I have a couple other odds and ends of Buscema, but most of my all of my Buscema is Avengers related. I just okay. it's what I loved. I appreciated his conan i appreciated other things but i am just a sucker for that that period that roy thomas period so okay. that's what i have yeah see it's it, so it really does come back to nostalgia for a lot of uh, the things that you're collecting not just because he's a john's a great artist he did oh, wonderful, wonderful absolutely work on, uh, absolutely like, on yeah. four, right i mean but uh but you're you it's for you it's the roy thomas avengers run it's the roy thomas avengers run it was thor is something i always look at and i think it's gorgeous looking i didn't read it i've mm -hmm. gone back and read it it's all fine and good better than fine and good but it 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 doesn't have the nostalgia for me. So in a world of John, any John Buscema art, I'm going to go with the nostalgia ones, but sure. I, I always look at any John Buscema up for sale, but I will tell you something semi sacrilegious. I was, despite being born in 1970, I am not big on any of the, I guess I'll call it any of the Marvel cosmic stuff, you know, any of the, like the Starlin, like, like any of that kind of stuff. And I understand, I know he came from Fantastic Four, but I was never a surfer guy. So don't get me wrong. Buscema Surfer is gorgeous. I just don't care, I guess is the answer. So very sacrilegious, whatever. <laughs> I did read the subby stuff. So, uh, 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 Tom Horvitz bringing up uh, Submariner. I mm -hmm. did read the Submariner stuff, maybe because of the cartoon, um, but I did read Submariner stuff. Um, same thing. I used to read those reprints of the early Submariner stuff. Um, and I have a little Submariner. I have a nice Submariner piece. And again, the nostalgia, but you know, that's again, what I read, how I read, what I, why I read it. Those, those are my sort of reasons. <laughs> No, oh, hey, uh, yeah. I mean, I love Starlin's work, but I'm not a big, um, you know, cosmic kind of collector either. And it's not because the stories aren't great or whatever. It's just not it was, it's stuff that I, probably, I really wasn't reading off the newsstand. And um, yeah, so it's not it's not like so nobody has to worry about me kind of competing for any of the, those kind of pages. Nor, nor me. I'm not the guy, not the guy. But nothing wrong with it. It uh, it's certainly it's fantastic. Helped. Go for it. I like Gardens of the Galaxy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, again, these are not complaints. It's just I'm not collecting it. There, there you go. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Now here, here's a here's an amazing uh, John Byrne piece. I mean, this this uh, everybody 
can easily recognize this. It's just such a uh, just a, such a pivotal moment in uh, X Men history, I think. And you know, I, kind of towards I the struggled to pick a burn piece. Um, I have many of them, as uh -huh. you all probably know. Um, but at the end of the day. I don't know, Days of Future Past, all these years later, to me, is still the definitive Chris Claremont X-Men story. Burn and Austin firing at the just, just full strength. And this splash page, which, as memory serves, had kind of gotten away from me once. And then at the time, I at the time ridiculously overpaid for it, but at a number that now of course seems like it was free, you know, again, you know, again, we're talking in the, I want to say maybe late nineties, because once I had gotten it, we gotten away from me. I, I had to get it back. I will say to you, I have regretted every days of future past with the future part on it that I have not like, that I didn't pick up when I had the opportunity, but this was the one, and this was the one I, I had to have to me. It was everything in one. It was just like, if I never get another page from this story, which by the way, I've never gotten another page from this story. <laughs> this is it because this is the story. And, uh, I don't know what else to say about it. I, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned before, 138 was the first issue I picked up on the newsstand, which is when uh, Phoenix has died and it's uh, uh, Cyclops, Scott Summers, basically the funeral and the, him sort of recounting the entire story of the X-Men. And so having, I, at the time I had been reading uh, the reprints in Amazing Avengers, I'd read like the first like six or seven. I, I finally realized, oh, there's this the, the uncanny X-Men. I pick it up and it's this issue where somebody's dead. I'm not quite sure who, but now they retell and they connect everything that I've been reading in these reprints and they take me all the way up. They explain how Jean Grey becomes Phoenix and, you know, whatever, sacrifices herself, blah, 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 blah. And, the, and so it catches me up on every year of like X-Men history. And then on the last page, Kitty Pride basically formally joins the team. And uh, how does one say this? Uh, she joined the team and I started reading X-Men. And so, you know, I, so, for me, Kitty Pride, this piece, it all just kind of locks in together. So, yeah. <laughs> well, see, we, we really did. So I picked up issue 127 was my first uncanny. I went program. back and yeah. I did buy all of those and figured, you know, again, sort of filled it all in. But like, yeah, for me, 138, like I said. So, yeah. Well, and Will Gabrielle is just tuned in as well, mentioning it's from me to John to you. <laughs> but I was trying to think, Will, since, hey, how are you? You, um. At one point before John got it, did you offer it to me and I stupidly turned it down? Because I felt like I had an opportunity for it and didn't get it and then regretted it and then later got it from John or maybe someone before you. Anyway, that's my memory of it, that I, I had a missed opportunity and wasn't going to let it happen again. But that's, again, a very sort of these things are way back here and they're sort of uh, what's the word? Uh, things are firing. Synapses are firing and I'm figuring it out. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll answer that if you can keep going. <laughs> it, it's tough when you get, when, when you pass up on something, because even like, so even back then, so this Family, is I am the num I am the number one first appearance collector. Um, I, I, uh, I actually invented my own, but you have to watch uh, Felix's podcast to learn about it. So I'm the, I'm the best. I'm the biggest. Yeah. You'll, you'll find out more about that. I, I, go I, on. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in utero pages Brett. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but uh but yeah but for me i mean that that storyline was kind of everything to just like you you know you started reading those books off the newsstand and then just to go straight through for you know for me it's like phoenix dies i mean those are like gut-wrenching stories and then you roll into this it was just amazing an amazing time to like be reading those books off the stands and be young and impressionable and be like, yeah, this is what comics are supposed to be, you know, and then having Vernon Austin, uh, you know, just doing so much, you know, such incredible work and Claremont just writing, you know, the hell out of these stories and making all the characters just so believable and visceral that 
yeah, it was unlike anything that I'd read up until that that point. And I was I was hooked on X Men, and I never, uh, you know, it's something. It's it's, a, it's an addiction I'll, that that I'll never that will never escape me. You know, and, yeah. And, no, uh, the 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 Chris Claire. I mean, they all do, but Chris Claremont in particular. Uh, I hope there's a special place one day uh, in whatever the afterlife is, because that man brought me a lot of joy. So it's true. I, I and yeah, I'm, I am so impressed with some of the. Like, we were at Heroes a couple weekends ago. His line is still the longest line it shows. I mean, it, Walt Simonson was getting kind of close, but Cl Chris. I mean, people really, you know, really get his contributions. I think to to the, the whole genre of uh storytelling for comics i mean nobody uh you know he made continuity he you know he infused some so many great things into uh into his stories that i don't know i mean he'll never be replaced as a storyteller so we're switching gears again on this next piece we're going over to, to uh, something uh miller dark knight related this was the bargain of a lifetime um Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't help it. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I was waiting for the punchline. <laughs> uh, it's starting to look reasonable. Um, look, what can I say? I, you know, I, I had a, I have a lot of Dark Knight. Uh, I, I, I've spoken already about the Dark Knight I had. Um, it didn't get much better for me than this piece of any page uh, from the book, as far as I was concerned. Uh, and, uh, when the time came, I bought it, I regretted it for a good solid, you know, couple of years there, um, but, uh, sold some stuff and I don't, you know, I know kind of what I sold. I sold some other interiors. I, I think I sold, uh, sold Felix a killing joke piece. Yeah. I wouldn't mind conceptually having it all back, but I don't miss any of it. And this is on my wall and it's, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Um, this is. Uh, you know, again, you know, it's like, this is what I remember, you know, when people would write about Dark Knight, this is what I remember seeing when I read Dark Knight, you know, and you're, 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 I, I, it's a strange combination of, I remember when those books would hit the the stands. And although I guess at that time I was buying from probably a uh, big Apple comics and I can remember like, like, like almost like stopping, like almost like in the hallway to flip through just to sort of like kind of get a sense of it. And on the one hand, like speeding through the book to kind of like what's happening, but then also on the other hand, hitting this page and just stopping because it just like took my breath away. Um, and it still does. And it, it just, it still does. And it's, it's so iconic, which is a great word, uh, Dave Kopecki, but at the same time, it's so its own thing because he remade Batman and he changed Robin. And so it's iconic, but yet he's just incredibly, sorry, I hit the mic there, just incredibly making the icon his own. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know quite what else to say. Um, just, uh, just, I love it. Uh, uh, it was a, it was hard to swallow at the time, but here we all are. We're all okay for it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you did okay. I mean, I, I, other people had mentioned it too, but I mean, that image right there, I think Ray, Ray said it as well. It's just, it's more iconic than in ways than some of the covers just because it, it's, uh, the covers were, were so different in the, in his, in the way Frank approached them. But that, that splash page is just burned in most, you know, collectors' I, I just, minds. I, it just, to me, like, you know, in a way, Dark Knight transcended comics sort of into culture. I mean, we see it every day now. Batman has really basically become Dark Knight in a weird way. But at the same time, like, I don't know. You just feel like every time somebody makes a movie, they're like, like that's in their lookbook. Like that's the that's the shot that they're he, the director is looking at with the cinematographer going, if we could do something like this in our Batman movie, we'd have mm -hmm. something. And I don't know. It just it speaks to me. Uh, and I. I have many Dark Knight pages. I have wonderful pages with wonderful dialogue and memorable lines, things that I remember, moments that I remember. I, 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 you know, there are things I can shout out, like moments I love when he gets hit in the chest. And it's like, why do you think I wear a target on my chest? Like things like that, that I, mm -hmm. you know, that I just, I love like moments and stuff. But just this is Dark Knight. I, I don't know what else to say. So, yeah. Well, this uh, this next piece is, I'm very envious of because if I could own a Dave Cockrum X Men cover, it would be this one. 
Yeah, I wasn't sure if I'd ever shared this or not. I couldn't remember, but I didn't think I had. So I thought this would be a good one. Um, you know, for me, Cockrum sort of splits into two halves because obviously there's pre-burn and there's post-burn. Mm -hmm. And I read the post-burn stuff before I went backwards and started being able to buy and afford the pre-burn Cockrum stuff, if that makes any sense. So for me, the, the post-burn, the second Cockrum run is very much in my head. I, I don't, it, Like that's my true, true love because I was buying those monthly on the newsstand as opposed to in like sort of back issue bins and paying money, which just somehow, you know, ruins it a little bit, if that makes any sense. And I, I just, there was something about this for me where the notion of Dr. Doom, you know, against the X-Men, even though obviously like there are things like you know, Spidey five where Stan and Steve did the same thing where you're taking, mm -hmm. you know, someone else's villain and bringing him in. But in, in, in Claremont's hands, I thought this was a, just an incredibly well done doom character appearance. I thought just Cockrum just knocks it out of the park on this piece. Just, just, just incredible. And just a truly great storyline. And again, right, you know, 145, right in there from that first year where I'm reading X-Men basically. So uh, a million things. And like I said, I didn't think I'd shown this one or certainly not in a long time. Uh, so uh, uh, yes, the doom robot. Oh, it's okay. I think it's a storm robot also, but anyway, um, <laughs> I, I just love it. And I, and there's something about, um, there's no one does like sort of knocked out X-Men on the ground like Dave Cockrum. It's kind of a running pattern in a, most of the covers <laughs> from both his runs. Uh, that's just a, his a, a, his calling card. So I always love to see how uh, how they're on there, basically, for lack of a better word, how the uh, how the, the bodies are splayed um, anyway. And anyway, I just I thought it was wonderful. Yes. Wonderful inks. Brian Peck there. Uh, hi. How are you, Brian? <laughs> um, but yeah, just uh, love this one. And again, I have many Cochrane pieces. I just, this was one that I, I thought people would get a kick out of seeing. No, uh, I do. I, and somebody said I was drooling off camera. I was a little <laughs> bit. I needed, I needed a little bit of time to clean up before I got back on here. But it's true. That, those were such great stories. I mean, you know, leading up to the, the issue 150 with Magneto. I mean, I'll, the, again, I, when I have the most nostalgia for that yeah period. i mean i hear all things you're not supposed to say but i'll say it to here everyone ready you want to bend me over and take advantage of me find me the cover with the fill-in team that goes with this you know the one where it's like spy banshee havoc polaris iceman mm -hmm. in the arcade thing find me that cover name your price and obviously sorry brian peck uh kitty's fairy tale that cover uh my oh do i love those so find me those two uh and just uh have your way with me so go ahead <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, it's happened before where somebody said that this is what I need, and then they end up getting it. So you, you just—I'm not gonna—I'm not gonna hold my breath. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, those, those are all good. Kitty's fairy tale is like at the you know way up there for me yeah. as well. I mean, oh my gosh. Well, uh, here's a. This is actually another uh, piece by Dave. Oh yeah. Um, again, I, I, I've, I've feel like I've, you know, it's funny. I was trying to think of again, things I hadn't shown off as much and I've shown the star Wars one by Chaikin a bunch. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I thought it'd be fun to do the treasury because the treasury, and I, again, I don't know how everyone else did it, but I read the treasury first. I read the treasury on a summer vacation trip or like, uh, after the movie had come out, I guess. Um, and I remember reading it like on the beach of like Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. I can't remember where, but it was somewhere my parents had like rented a house with like another family. And I remember on the beach, seven years old, like reading the treasury with my dad and he had taken me to see star Wars and we'd seen it. We'd sat through it twice. So the first time. And, uh, Again, this is all part of why this treasury is so great, but also it's great. Obviously, the classic sort of Hildebrand pose and whatnot, um, but just, just, just incredible. So anyway, all of that in that. Uh, so there you go. It's uh, very much Star Wars comics. My dad being a kid, all that in one. So tied up with a nice bow. <laughs> 
That's that's gorgeous. I mean, absolutely. And I think uh, I don't know. I, I I read. I know I read that. I, I did not read the Star Wars comics individually. I bought the part one and the part two. I didn't have the one that had them all together until mm-hmm. years later. I didn't even know that third one existed. And then I think at the Woolworths near where I grew up, I bought them like them the bagged versions of the, the the regular size comics the sort of it was like one bag had like one two and three and the other mm-hmm. bag had four five and six right and uh yeah um and so for me star wars you know just in terms of my collecting where i do collect these other things i have i have a big toy collection i have a big movie prop collection mm-hmm. star wars runs through all of my collecting so i have star wars comic art star wars toys and star wars movie props and so that's kind of another piece to the whole thing for me a little bit which is again kind of cool i think so yeah right well i mean back in the day we all got our comic books from the drugstore right i mean that was that's the only place you can get them there were two drugstores in the the city i grew up in and uh that's that's where I uh we believe it or not comics, I, really. we I bought mine for the most time at a newsstands but the 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 this the Woolworths or five and dime as we used to call it mm-hmm. they had a, I think Ron Lim just pointed out yeah the, it was the Whitman bagged ones and it was just those like wrapped in plastic sets and there were other comics too but I that's how I remember getting those um yeah whoever Knights of old the seven this the fact that Star Wars was continuing mm-hmm. um was just mind baffling to whatever eight-year-old me uh and then obviously as i came to realize later you know kind of a magnificent seven ripoff and all that kind of stuff just just incredible so yeah um oh there's a very interesting piece here (laughs) um you know when you were asking me about artists and obviously uh, burn and miller were guys high on the list and you know, Dicko is very much up there for me. Uh, again, a guy that I didn't read on the stands per se. Um, obviously, used to watch the uh, the cartoon on Channel Five in New York City all the time. You know, Spider Man, Spider Man does whatever mm-hmm. Spider can. Um, but some of my earliest comic memories, um, and eventually, I was buying Marvel Tales and reading the reprints of everything. But my my school. Uh, my elementary school used to do like a, a, a yearly November book fair. And at the book, one of the early book fairs, one of my earliest book memories um, was the box with the three or four, I guess, was it three or four of the, the Ditko Spider-Man uh, paperbacks that basically, you know, changed the way the panels were, but basically I think reprinted again, the first X number of issues. And so, uh, that's what that's how I read Dick, that's how I read Spider-Man first. Um, and for me, again, obviously John Romita, incredible. Lots of great people worked on Spider-Man. Gil Kane, whatever. They're all wonderful. Ditko is Spider-Man. It just it's that simple for me. Uh, I, 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 I'm embarrassed to admit this. I don't even have a Romita piece of Spider-Man art in my collection. I used to years ago and it actually left me when I was buying to buy more Ditko. I, 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 uh, the, the Spider-Man, Dr. Strange, the pre-hero stuff, the, uh, the, uh, the creepy and eerie wash stuff written by Archie Goodwin. Uh, I, I love it all. I love it. Um, it just anyway. And I just thought this was a real fun one. I love those, the, these pinups in general. I love like the annual pinups. I love, you know, whatever this, they, they needed a page and they put this in. I like that it's signed and all that kind of stuff. I like that the lettering barely, you know, hand lettering barely kind of works its way around the arm there. Like it's so unplanned. It's just kind of wonderfully alive. And, uh, it's just Steve Ditko inking himself doesn't get much better than that. So yeah, no, it's a beauty. I've uh, I've seen I've seen a fair number of Ditko Spider Man pages. Of, you know, Berkey's had a few pass through sure. that I've gotten to see. But yeah, this is I've one of the things I've tried to do in my collection. Believe it or not, is I uh, I have sort of been trying to accumulate. I mean, that's the wrong word. Collect, I guess. Both <laughs> for me, it's both. Um, one good example of the major Spidey villains by Steve Ditko. Mm. And uh, I actually picked up a piece uh, last fall 
uh, from Spidey 18, which is a Sandman page, mm -hmm. which actually I've lent to the Spider-Man exhibit down at the Comic-Con Museum, which will be down there during Comic-Con. So I've lent that to them along with a McFarlane Spidey piece from my collection, um, which I haven't gone down and seen it yet, but I'm going to go down and see it. But that's the Sandman was a tough one because he's in Spidey 4, which is complete and he's in the annual two, which no one's really seen and we think is complete. And so he's on a couple of pages in 18. And I, there was a bad page a couple of years ago. I'm sorry, bad page, just a lesser page. But this was a good fighting page. And that's what I've been trying to do is get a good fight page between Spidey and like the key villains. So that's been my one of my other various sort of collecting projects. Sometimes I don't find one, you know, for, you know, seven years go by and I find one. Sorry, <laughs> annual one, Brad. I apologize. Correct. Um, anyway. Well, that's yeah, a great yeah. example, but that's, that's, but that's cool. Kind of hearing that, you know, that's a side kind of collecting objective of yours, Ditko villain pages. I mean, you know, we've all got our things, right? Tom, I, hold on, Tom Horvitz. I don't, but anytime you want to sell me a space cover, I'm good. I'm good. Anytime I'm ready. So you let me know. <laughs> I regret not bidding on those. You were right. I was wrong there. I said it. Um <laughs> Oh, I mean, it, that's see, that's what's fun about this hobby is, you know, there's there's moments like those that you have with other collectors where uh, you're debating the merits of uh, certain pieces of art or uh, artists contributions well, to a certain it's, genre. It's and, and you skip it over. My rule you... was very much always, you know, for me, again, the nostalgia. And so obviously I did not read 1950s Charlton Ditko. I didn't, sure. I've never barely seen 1950s Charlton Ditko. Dicko gets me to break my own rule a little bit. And by the way, I have subsequently gone out there and found the stuff and read it, you know, and some of it's better than others. I don't mm -hmm. have any Mr. A art, but I do appreciate it. But, you know, it's that kind of thing where I just, I dig his stuff so much that it has gotten me to kind of chase after various old reprints and whatnot and look for things. And I just find his work so interesting that I kind of, uh, kind of go for it. It did go in general. So definitely high on my art list. Sorry. There's a phone ringing in the background, but I apologize. Anyway, did go, did go, did go. It's excellent. Good job, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, Ditko is an acquired taste. When I was younger, I didn't like him at all. Um, but today I just, I wish Oh, that's funny. You know, I wish I, I had something by him because no, I didn't my, get it. my, my, uh, and I've probably said this somewhere before too. Um, my, when I was younger, I didn't get him and hated him was Bill Sienkiewicz. And of course <laughs> now I fucking love him. Can't get enough of it. But he was somebody he took, I got immediately. When, oh, when really... he took over new mutants, I was just like, what, what is happening? Like, just like, <laughs> can I call the editors and I, I can't read this. I can't, what, like, this is unreadable. <laughs> and now of course it's just like, Oh, demon bear page. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'd, I'd love a, a page from New Mutants. I'd love a page from uh, his early Moon Knight stuff from the Marvel magazines. I mean, that would. Oh yeah, that's that, stuff that would really bring nice. me joy. Yes. Like like nothing else. I, I don't. I wouldn't even need something from the Moon Knight books. I mean, if I could get one of his early pieces where he was just kind of coming into his own, he was losing the Neil Adams feel. And he was, really I had a very funny piece from years ago that someone has in their collection now. And I don't know who, so forgive me, but I used to own it. Uh, I, I do wish I've mentioned this previously. Someone had the idea years ago and it might've been the late, uh, the late uh, Bruce Lowry actually, um, which was that when we buy a piece of art and we sell it, in pencil on the back, we should write our name so that as it makes its way around the world, you would pick up a piece and go, oh, my God, Bill Cox used to own this. And right. then, you know, and then so and so owned it and whatever. And that, you know, again, all in pencil would be very minor in the back or whatever. Um, but uh, no one ever did that. But anyway, I used to own this piece, I think it was from like the Comics Journal or one of the comic magazines where it was Bill drawing moon Knight, but he's kind of like pushing his way past batman and there's like a joke about how he kind of was ripping off neil kind of mm -hmm. a thing like anyway it was very sort of an in joke on sinkevich at the time as he was sort of making his transition and it kind of left me because it was not it was funny but it was not anything that either killed me or was meaningful to me which you know again does happen over the time but Boy, do I love Bill stuff. He actually did some art for us for White House Plumbers, which people oh, will cool. get a chance to see uh, in the show. He sort of made a, there's a, 
there's an art pitch where they they need to show art and he bill did the art which is pretty incredible so yeah that was very fun and exciting yeah oh well, i mean was that yeah. a your uh and yes yes it was not a coincidence <laughs> somebody else said hey this yeah. guy might be pretty good <laughs> Yeah, have you ever heard of someone named Bill Sienkiewicz? <laughs> and Mike Lovitz, who's on here somewhere, I think made the deal. The only thing I did tell them was I said, don't pay him all the money till he actually gets the stuff. And I love him to death, but not going to make that mistake, Bill Sienkiewicz, wherever you are. I love you, but not paying until you finish. <laughs> <laughs> right. You've got a deadline. You, you know. Yeah. Real deadlines. Real deadlines. Movie making. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's it. We're switching gears again uh, on on this piece, but uh, this is a, this is a really really amazing. Dave Givens, Watchmen, two page. Um, I mean, this is storytelling at its best. Uh, that's you know, it's so funny. That's exactly why I. Uh, that's exactly why I picked it. Uh, I just, to me, I, you know, again, in the thousands of memorable pages of the Watchmen, I'm not sure anyone else. Maybe I, again, I you know, I don't. I can't answer who remembers these pages and who doesn't or whatever, but this, this moment of the sort of peering into his soul, peering into the, uh, the what's the quote that Almore uses, you know, the, the Nietzsche, whoever stares into the abyss of just basically the comedian kind of coming to terms with his life. It stinks. It stinks. It all stinks. Uh, I just incredible writing, incredible art, the nine, the nine panel grid. I mean, I don't know what else to say, but I, when I look at a page like this, to me, it's not even art. It's like great acting, you know, just to draw a comparison to what, you know, my sort of little world, like this is incredible acting, these shots, but I mean, look at the, look at the pathos on the, on the, on that one left most close the, the, the only close-up on mm -hmm. the page we're with him on the bed he's there we're we're the guy in bed we're with this guy it's our pov and then all of a sudden this just extreme close-up and it just those eyes just hit you and I, I don't know what else to say you know it just uh uh, I did not buy uh, Rich because it was the comedian, I, but it was, the, but it was the comedian, but not the comedy connection. So yeah, um, but uh, God damn. So yeah. Yeah, we're getting a few spammers in our show tonight. See, we're doing so well that uh, we get spammed. <laughs> but, but all kidding aside, NakedHD.fun is one of the best adult dating sites I've ever been a part of. <laughs> <laughs> uh like I say, it's it, this always happens when I have a great guest on, David. So. You've, you, you've, you're definitely at that status. Because I think Facebook is just happy that we're not uh, about to shoot anybody or anything. So just, they're just very content yes, exactly. this is just nerdy goodness. So, yeah. No, but that is a, that's a great page. I mean, if I had just one Watchmen page, I mean, that, that would be a good one to have right there. Um, let's see here. Another... Uh, so I did pick, I forgot, I, I can't even remember what I chose. And by the way, everyone, it is more than 18. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, uh, this is a piece actually, again, Tom Horvitz. Uh, I did not know you'd be here, but I believe I got this from Tom. Um, Dicko, pre-hero. I, I love the pre-hero stuff. This is a story he kind of did, you know, three or four versions of, I feel like, you know, they kind of reuse the same ideas over and over. So there's one version that has like statues and whatnot, you know, but it's always sort of good versus evil and whatnot. But I just... It, it, it's about whites and blacks and it's just, it's just, I don't know what else to say. I, I just, it's an incredible story. I, I, I have the whole story, but this is, this is incredible. This is just uh this splash. Just uh, I, I just, to me, it's just so powerful. Um, yeah. Sorry, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is a great you know really, really great image. I mean, I love it. And uh, it's, it's got all the things that you would want in a, in a Ditko page, to be honest, I mean, I just, I love, uh, I love everything about it. And, uh, I'm sorry, Ray, Ray says, yes, thank, you, Ray. thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, but no, it's a, it's a good one. And again, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the pieces that you, you picked tonight, David, because they weren't ones that I was expecting to see as well. I mean, I kind of figured we were going to go for the heavy hitters. And like I said, it, again, Giant Size X-Men and whatever, Death of Electra, Daredevil 181, they are available for you to look at on my uh, CAF at any time you want. I'm guessing most of you have seen them. Uh, I don't, they're great. I don't have much new to add about them. If you want me to talk about them, ask a question, I'll answer it. But I just <laughs> thought it'd be fun to show you some of the other stuff that I love, I, I guess, is the honest answer. So yeah, that was my my goal a little bit. 
to teach. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. And you know, I actually, because uh, you, you have some of the pieces in the in the Marvel exhibit right now as well. Yeah, uh, I believe, and because I, I know I saw a few of them uh, in Columbus, and we're taking a group there next month as well. Oh, uh, in that Marvel exhibit, no, my pieces are out. I think mine. Are are, mine out? Yeah, I'm sorry, mine, mine left after C mine previous. left after Seattle, so I don't know what they're still using or showing. But mine left after Seattle. Uh, uh, with no offense to uh, Ohio, uh, oh man, I, I was sort of hoping that to us. I was hoping I would get London or Tokyo or such. And when it kind of was like we're going to Toronto and then Detroit, I was just like, ah, just give me my stuff back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I, I, then I apologize. I, I I don't know why I still thought that your stuff was in there, but I remember seeing. I guess it's because I, I've seen photos from er, the earlier exhibits. I'm sure. I'm sure because it was yeah. in Philly and. Uh, Maybe I think I was in Seattle and Philly, and then I pulled my stuff. I honestly, I've lost. It's been a while. I've lost track. Sorry, barking dog. Uh, apologies. Uh, yes, sorry, Ray Cuthbert. I I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, Kevin O'Neill, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, the black and white is incredible looking, and uh, they did an art book of it. You know, they did one of those. Uh, I can't remember if, if Scott did it or if Graffiti did it. I, I get I get lost, but somebody did it, and it was great. Um, it must have been Scott. Uh, and the black and white art to me just looks incredible. And this was a real favorite piece. I actually was the one who kind of basically bought it all from Kevin O'Neill and kind of found a couple of people to kind of take issues from me. And then I kept a bunch too. Um, and this was just one of my favorite pieces. Um, both just obviously Alan Moore, the story and all of those things. But in art itself for three seconds, this kind of painting, which was a very sort of popular style in, I think, like the 17th and 18th century, where people would do paintings of rooms of their collections, if you will, is something I've always loved. And actually, I think Phil Noto once sort of did like a mini version of that when he was kind of hanging with me at my place. Um, I've always wanted to have like a painting of my place with all the stuff on the wall done and i so i i'm sure there's some art name for it and i but i i love the style of it and the storytelling in the individual paintings but then also how they all look there with obviously like hide in the mirror and the invisible man not there and the proper uh representation of Captain Nemo and Mina, but with the black cat and the little Lilliputian horse on the ground and just the other oddities and Quartermain. Anyway, I, 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 I love it. I, I kept a bunch of it. I love it. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't blame you. And, and I don't think I see a lot of this artwork on the market too often. So I feel like the people that ended up with it kind of were very happy to get it. I feel yeah. like one or two issues maybe has gotten broken up. Um, so, you know, if someone wants a page, I think they can get one, but uh, uh, I, like I said, just love it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, I, I adore it as well. And I love the stories. Those were so much fun. And are uh, these, I'm sorry, someone wrote it and said it's a salon piece. Is that the name of it? Are these salon pieces? Because that's a great name if that's what they're called. So anyway, if they're not, I don't know. But yeah. salon piece, I, I like the name. Um, I wish someone would come and do a salon piece of my collection. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah oh, man, that's uh well. And and by the way, you know, again, we were talking Claremont, but Alan Moore, Alan Moore, Alan Moore, and I probably could have picked. I could have done, I could have done eighteen Alan Moore pieces. You know what I mean? It's like you know. So again, for me, it's the art, but also the writing. And I think, uh, uh, you know, again, this art speaks for itself. But I love it because also those first two original League stories to me were just so. Again, perfect. I, I don't know what else to say. So, again, not just the art, but the writing too, the combo, the the moment. You're salon right. style. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I guess I had a salon style background until I took it all down. There you go. There you go. But it's not really. It's salon style. But then someone has to paint it. That's when it really becomes something. Right. Like exactly. That. Well, that hasn't happened. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> someday. Someday. Uh, so we're switching gears back to the X Men here, but uh, but boy, you know. Kirby wasn't on my, I don't even think Kirby made my top 10 list when I was talking about uh, my favorite X-Men uh, artists and whatnot. But but this is, uh, you know, Kirby Stone, always a great 
team up. And this is a I I thing. I am particular love Kirby Stone. Obviously, Kirby Stone on the X Men. I will I I love 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 particularly on the X Men. With no offense to Mister Reinman, but uh, I I do like uh, the Stone inks. Um, uh, I, 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 as I said before, I kind of was talking about reading these in the reprints. And so, yes, I know I didn't put him in my top five, but he's there in spirit. Um, and, uh, I, I just, I, what can I say? Uh, it's just, uh, you know, early danger room, everybody doing a little bit of something Scott with the, 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 the struggle to be the team leader, even though how much he loves Jean Grey, but can't tell her. Uh, I love that. I believe they're sort of playing around with Jean's new, like uh, sort of like how that sort of thing's going to go on her head. And they keep kind of messing with it and changing it and whatnot. And I, anyway, I just, none of this training would help you three seconds against Magneto, by the way, he would kill you. If you're like, <laughs> I'm going to thread this and I'm going to make a big stick and I'm going to bounce on a ball. But nevertheless, uh, the danger room, it's just everything I want in the sort of my X-Men world. And uh, you know, what else can you say? Uh, Stan and Jack, or at least Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah. Anthony says he broke up this book, but uh, he's glad to see that you have it. And uh, what Rick says, um, museum piece, of course, yes. Uh, we we say that a lot around here that you know piece, some of these pieces belong in a museum. That's one of them. You know that really, really does. Out of uh, the first ten books, I'd say that's such a such a classic image. Mazzucelli. Um, this sort of, again, you know, now we're kind of up to Frank Miller, the writer. Um, but I, look, I just don't think you can talk about, I mean, you, you can, there's dark Knight, and we've talked about it, but not that anyone is forgetting Batman year one, but you can't forget Batman year one. It's, they go hand in hand, you know, they are the bookends of Batman. And, uh, 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 I got this from Mr. Mazzuchelli in a very complicated way that is very hard to describe. Uh, I had ended up with uh, the with a Daredevil uh, trade paperback cover by Mazzuchelli that turned out he had never gotten back and had been stolen out of Marvel. And I gave it back to Mr. Mazzuchelli and ultimately was sort of able to buy this from him I paid for it. So somewhere in there, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly, I didn't give it back and get this, but uh, the opportunity uh, and sort of, I love the piece. The story wasn't my favorite story in the world, but it's an interesting one. Uh, Felix, I think I have discussed it on one of his old podcasts, mm -hmm. um, but I'll take the cover. Uh, is, uh, I, and interestingly enough, I tried to get the ad piece out of him. If you guys can remember the ad piece with the figure of Batman, because I figured he wouldn't want to break the books up and give up one of the covers. And surprisingly, he wanted to give me something, which I guess speaks well of him or not again, not give me, I did pay for it, but he, he, I guess he, I don't know. He want, maybe that ad piece was like something he'd done earlier. It's a slightly different version of Batman. It's a little bit, you know, it's more kind of inky and kind of black, a little more shadowy. Um, but I, again, this is, I, I do think this is the definitive Mazzuchelli bat image. I, but again, I, I love this story. I love this story every bit as much as I love dark Knight. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. It's just pretty incredible. Yeah, no, it's it's gorgeous. I mean, uh, every you know, he's he was a uh, he's an artist who I've always admired, and have you just don't see a lot of his artwork out there on the market. No, People once in a blue, it. once in a blue moon, I I, I, I find some odds and ends from like rubber blanket and stuff, and I mm -hmm. I've grabbed them, you know, when I can, you know, again, you know, really, you know, just interest, always just interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, sometimes you see the Daredevil pages, the the ones from before the Miller run that are inked by like Danny Bulanati or Bulandi. Forgive me. I don't know. I can't remember. Bulandi, I think, is the pronunciation. And, you know, you can sort of see Mazzuchelli sort of struggling to kind of fight through the inks a little bit with no offense to Mr. 
Bulandi or Bulanati or however he pronounces it. Um, and then obviously the one Daredevil issue that's been broken up is a good one, but not necessarily my favorite one. The Born Again trade cover was incredible. And I don't know, perhaps I'll live long enough uh, to one day he'll want to get rid of it. But anyway, yeah, uh, very sad. But here we go. <laughs> Batman well, year one at least. So yeah. If this was uh yeah, this this is a good one. This is uh Bulanati. Uh Bulanati. Thank you. Right, Long time you. Micronauts inker, I want to say, right, Andrew Allen? Does that sound right? Does sound, anybody? Yes, Micronauts inker for a correct. long time. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think so. All right, now thank we're gonna you, thank you, Rick Welch. Sorry, yes. Oh, yep. And uh so, okay, so we have two two millers in a row here. Uh oh. And they're good ones. This is my favorite one. This is my this is the Daredevil cover that I drew and 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 drew very, very poorly. This is the one that I even started playing like the Marvel role playing game just to kind of create stick and stone and claw and shaft and daredevil and basically basically play out the white ninjas and the hand and all of that kind of stuff this is this is the one it is i don't know it's samurai noir and that's that's what this is uh i just i i i i yeah i'm speechless i love this one so much so yeah <laughs> Now, how long? I mean, just out of curiosity, I mean, when did you pick this up? I mean, is this? Uh, oh boy, uh, uh, let's see. Late nineties, yeah. late nineties from a wow. from a comic store owner. I think he's on eBay nowadays. I think down in North Carolina, maybe. I like. I'll think, I'll think of his name in a bit. He for I kind of bumped into him initially because he used to sell really interesting, like old trade, like things you couldn't find. Like he was the guy that would always have like a good copy of like not just the soft cover, but like the hard cover version of uh, Origins and Son of Origins and the the Bring on the Women book and Bring on mm -hmm. sorry Bring on the Bad Guys and the Women's Marvel book, but like the hard cover versions of those of those books, which were really rare and hard to find. Um, no, not John Hitchcock. I'm going to think of it in a bit. And he had a store down in North Carolina. He sold on eBay. And I don't remember. I think he must have told me he had it because I don't think he ever like put it up publicly. And then we, we worked it out, I think, unless he put it in a CBG ad because it was still the time of CBG. And I saw it there and got it. I honestly want to say, though, it wasn't an ad. And I just found out he had it from conversation and worked it out with him on the phone. And it was tense a little back and forth to get it at the number which again now seems like nothing but of course at the time seemed you know like something else um but uh this was the one and this was the one i mean and again obviously the 181 speaks for itself a lot of them speak for themselves but i guess if you were to get rid of if you were to get rid if, if i had to lose all of them this would be the one i held on to this is this is my all-time favorite miller daredevil cover i just i don't it is what it is so yeah <laughs> No, it's gorgeous. I mean, those are uh, those stories changed comics for me. You know, reading, yeah. reading those. I mean, they 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 were just amazing. I eat every month to get the next issue, right? I mean, it, they couldn't come fast enough. So, you know, Miller was doing an incredible job, um, but the artwork was equally great. I mean, you know, uh, you can argue lots of lots of different ways, you know, about the uh, you know clauses contributions to it, but uh, but I always thought that the stories. By themselves were just incredible stories. I mean, I, I, I want. Yeah, I mean, look at this I, point. I didn't care you know, what they are, what, what, on what some they are. on some of the interiors more than others, and I think you can sort of see where it is. Obviously, Jansen's doing, you know, you know, whatever the breakdowns and whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, would I trade that for the X Wing? Oof, no, I wouldn't. Isn't that unbelievable? I wouldn't. That's my favorite. I couldn't. I couldn't do that. I, I could not do that. Um, I actually owned the, which is the 170, is the 179 the Electra one with the, with the Psy? Is that the 179? I'm going to double check. I'm not sure. Let's see. Is that right? What's the Daredevil 179, people? Uh, yeah, 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 that's the one with the Psy. Um, I actually own that, believe it or not, and uh, and I let it go. So there you go. I actually think this is much better. But again, 
it is one man's opinion. And so knights of old, I hope you own the 179 if it is your favorite. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I would keep, this is, this is the one. Uh, but I might let go of the 181 for the uh, the X-Wing if the uh, the buyer is interested. So there you go. Um, or at least certainly one of the other ones. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not sure art hunting exists now, Stanley. Um, I used to love art hunting. Again, I was married. I was, I was single, no kids. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have a couple of months off in the summer. I would go to every show. I would go to weird shows. I would, you know, I would you know, get my CBG like air mailed to me and tear it open and then get on the phone and, you know, start calling dealers and, you know, drive to the middle of New Jersey with like a, an envelope of cash to a comic book store because they had the uh, Superman with the tank um, Dark Knight right. page and do a deal, you know, just stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a, uh, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, no, it wasn't for the Darth Vader helmet. It was for something else. I'll have to remember. It was before the, it was before the Darth Vader helmet. I have to think about what it was. Um, but it was a long time ago, and I have to. Oh no, maybe it was that Vader helmet, the first one. Uh, anyway, I got to think about that. Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I loved that. I loved tracking stuff down. I also loved. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but over the course of the years, I mean, as as, as I've sort of made it clear, not because I was trying to get pieces out of them, but as I bumped mm -hmm. into like some of these guys that I loved, like I got to know some of them that had nothing to do with art. I mean, I got to play in poker games with like Marv Wolfman and Len Wein. That has nothing to do with art. That's just like, that's just, you know, 12 year old me's weird nerdy fantasy, <laughs> uh, you know, playing in this just very, they, they took this game very seriously. It was Marv and Len and Jerry Bingham and Steve Mitchell. I mean, it was just, they took it all very seriously. Um, and it was great. And it's just like, I'm playing with these guys, you know? So that, that was part of, again, I wasn't there for the hunt, but that was part of the journey, I guess. And that's just kind of gone now. Oh God. I think Mike Barr was at that game. That's right. Yes. Uh, Tom. So yeah, it was just kind of, so no strip art poker, just uh, <laughs> very serious, low stakes, but they took it seriously. And God help you if you like tried to raise too much because you didn't really know how to play poker, but you were pretending you like you did because you just want to be playing with them. So uh, uh, which is 189, Nick Barucci? Uh, is that uh, that's which issue? Is that the it's the one before 190? Is that the one where they're fighting the hand and. With with Black Widow on the cover, which is that I'm looking. I used to know this by heart. Oh, do I have pages from that? Yes, I do. But I don't know what I have. I have pages from 186, 187, 188, 189. I have pages from all those issues. I guess is the answer. Uh, different Tell pages. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, I remember um, there was a one of our first conversations. With yeah. Hey, Johnny McCloskey. The weird thing is, is he was bluffing. He only had like a pair of threes, but he put the giant size X-Men in <laughs> and uh, I won. So that was kind of good. Um, I, I don't know who had the best poker face, but I pretty sure Marv Wolfman had the worst, but anyway. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But I remember um, probably like in 2004, I was talking to you about, uh, you know, wanting like Frank Miller or uh, John Byrne X-Men before I had either. And I never, sure. I've actually never had a Frank Miller Daredevil page, but I had, I did own some Byrne X-Men. But I remember, I just remember the, like you, you, you said, yeah, I've got a lot of them, you know, I'm not really looking to sell any, but I just, you know, I remember back then it was like, you know, what the prices were. You think about, think about that compared to where they, where they are at today. But I was always impressed by the fact that you're like, oh, I got, I got a lot from a lot of different issues. And I was just always blown away by that. It's like, oh, gosh, how can, how is that possible? How can uh, how can anybody do that? But you you know you just you you, you love that work so much that it's just uh, I, I don't know. I'm no, ending. I did. Hey uh, Peter, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but uh, I will tell you a funny story. I did not get the 188 either. It turned out though it was purchased. I think at that show, unless it stopped somewhere else first, but I missed it completely. Um, but it was purchased by the uh director um michael layman who did heathers and then went on to do a bunch of stuff and then years later i finally kind of tracked him down through a mutual friend and was sort of like 
Hey, do you still have that cover? I really want to buy it from you. And he was like, I would absolutely sell it to you, but I just gave it to heritage because I was getting a divorce or something. And I literally, you missed Dude, it by two days it. or one of those things. And I missed it out. And then, uh, well, I guess whatever. I bought it at Heritage, so I own that one as well now. So anyway, there you go. Uh, timing <laughs> um, is everything in this. Yep, hobby. that cost I guess fifteen. Well, fifteen no, but yeah, that went for a pretty penny. But again, my other real favorite that Black Widow one. God damn, I love mm -hmm. that one too. So yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Another great. Uh, yeah, Black Widow page would be pretty cool. Um, well, let's see what is it. Uh, was Tom saying a oh, Weiss and I sold Lehman a lot of crumb? Okay, uh, Tom, I gotta have you get, get you on the show sometime. I actually, yeah, Tom uh, would be a good, uh, you know, a little old school. He's got some stories, knows where a few dead bodies he uh buried a few people in the, the Palm Springs <laughs> desert. I think you know, you know I emailed him. about yeah. it about a year ago and we kind of <laughs> dropped the ball on it, but uh, maybe I can convince him to go on sometime. It'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, let's see here. Oh, the uh. Oh, here. Well, I, well, I have no idea. I know we're past 18, but uh... yes, yes, but well, we're getting close. We're getting close. But um, yeah, this was the other the other Miller. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I again, I think people knew I had it, but I sort of felt the need to represent all aspects of Miller. Um, you know, again, I, I sound like a broken record. This this will forever be Ronin to me. Uh, I, I love the futuristic stuff. It was it was all insane and wonderful. I loved his take on the future. But this, I just, you know, I, you know, again, picked up the first issue of Ronin. What's Ronin? Who's Ronin? What's a Ronin? Whatever. And kind of got sucked in and then bammo. Uh, so, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, just, uh, oh, yeah. Nope, I've been in, I've, I've loved Ronan forever, and I'd love to own a page by you know from it, but and probably never will at this. And point again, and rate. again, I, and I, the other thing I was gonna say is, and Miller, the writer for three seconds, although Miller, the artist as well, but it's just so fun to see him channeling, and he does this with all his stuff, but obviously here in particular, just him channeling his love of like, you know, like these Japanese movies and stuff, and I, anyway, just just kind of just kind of wonderful and insane. So yeah, well. Yeah, no, the, uh, everything about this page. I mean, this is, it, it you know, again, this was that era where, you know, it was in a, it, the format of the books were different. I mean, it, it just was so, it's so cool. And just to, to see a, something kind of come out of that uh, was by an artist who was getting really, could have done almost anything they wanted. And that, and they chose to tell the, yeah. tell that story. I, I don't know. I, I, I loved it. I hated it. Uh, do beep are, I do. I have, uh, I have a, I think I have two lone wolf covers. Uh, I have the number five, which I particularly love again. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, love lone wolf again, because of Miller's why I mm -hmm. sort of picked it up. And then obviously, you know, everything about it. Uh, do I own any Miller, Frank Miller sketch covers? I'm going to take the fifth on that and move along. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marcus, for always put, bringing a smile to our to, to the faces of, of whomever I have on the show, including <laughs> my own. Uh, well, all right, we've we've mentioned this X Men artist earlier. I I, I felt the need to put a Paul Smith in. I I sort of had to. Um, uh, go into more Tom Horvitz stories. Look at Tom. This is your night. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't even think to tell you uh, whatever. I know you, you're you here, so you figured it out, but I didn't even think that this was going to come up, whatever. Um, I got to know Paul through Tom. Paul, uh, Tom sort of repped him for a while to whatever extent one reps Paul Smith, who at the time wasn't really doing a lot, but was sort of supposed to be working on Leave It to Chance, which I also loved and sadly has kind of gone away. Um, yeah. And through Tom, um, Paul was a huge, um, he, two things he particularly loved. He loves uh, Ditko. And if you've ever seen some of his sketch stuff, he'll do sort of his version of Ditko, which he loves. And he loves Alex Raymond. And Tom had a couple of Raymond pieces. They were like illustrations or for like a Christmas card or something, maybe, or, or maybe it was a men's magazine. Illustration. They were gorgeous and they were big and whatever. And I can't remember, there were multiple deals in there, but basically there was a version of Tom did a trade with him for something. And then I think I bought it from Tom, but then I did a trade with Paul myself and got a couple of these covers. Anyway, this is Wolverine rogue. Uh, you know, when, 
when Wolverine was Wolverine, as they say. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, that 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 Paul Smith run of those uh, the, the, those the, the the entire run, um, the the stories by Claremont, the, the 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 visit to Japan, the Brood, all of that stuff. I, I just, I, I just, what can I say? Uh, there you go. Paul got an Alex Raymond painting in the deal. Um, anyway, yeah. So it, it kind of worked out really well for everybody. <laughs> he was happy. I was happy. The one cover he would not let go of that he was saving, I think for like his niece or nephew or something like that. Um, I want to say very sadly, I feel like he'd had a brother that maybe had passed away or something like that. Um, you know, Paul was a character. He used to like just not show up or just show up on his motorcycle out of nowhere, that kind of a thing. Anyway, um, but the Kitty Pride one, you know, with her her back up against the uh, up against sort of the downstairs, the danger room with Lockheed, whatever. Like he he wouldn't uh, he would not. That was the one he was keeping. But he he let this and a couple others go, uh, and just yeah, I I, I love it. Uh, see you. I think you have uh, surpassed the any number of webcam <laughs> spams we've ever gotten. I think this is the fourth one I've had a block tonight, David. <laughs> You're a popular guy on YouTube, so that's all right. That's that's good. So uh, here's here. You know, I, I wasn't a big DC guy, but Perez made me a DC guy. Thanks yeah, I do feel like I put up a lot of more. There's been a lot of Marvel tonight, I guess, in my mind, but. Um, I, I love Perez on the Avengers. Um, I don't know it quite as well, but I certainly love, I, I loved what I read. Um, but, uh, but boy, the, the Titans run and specifically, I mean, I, I, I loved it all, but boy, oh boy, the, the moments, the, 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 what the, the Judas contract with the betrayal, Tara and, uh, and Deathstroke and, uh, you know, ironic this, you know, today after yesterday, uh, but the, the violence of the gun here, um, the, that, that Perez, uh, I don't know, is this one Romeo Tengal inked also? I don't know, but the, 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 the glean of the inking, the, the armor just, oh man, I, uh, I just, yeah. Uh, what can I say? Uh, a huge fan. Just to me, those first 50 issues is one of the few runs to me you can put up against Claremont, the, that original Titans run. And then it starts to, you know, again, and maybe it goes past there. The, into the Baxter stuff was pretty great. And obviously when Perez leaves, it lo leaves, it kind of loses a, a baby step for me. Although I still thought they were some great stories, but the teaming of, uh, Wolfman and Perez, just, just, just incredible. So, uh, I, I, I felt the need to put one of these up for Perez and also having lost him this year. So, yeah. Well, this is a great example and, uh, moving over to another great example, uh, this Rocketeer piece is, uh, I, I feel bad because I was trying to put up stuff I hadn't put up and then literally having sent this one thinking I had never shown this one, I got one of those like, you know, Facebook, like, do you remember this from three years ago where I guess, I don't know, on like one of Dave's birthdays or something, I put this up and I realized, oh, people might have seen it. So I, I do apologize. I was trying to put up a Dave piece that maybe I hadn't shown off lately. Um but uh, this was a piece, obviously, from the Rocketeer. Some of you may or may not know. I was friends with Dave sort of in the back end of his life. Uh, Calvin Mao and I were sort of very responsible. We were sort of tasked by him to get the Rocketeer back in print. And he and I sort of oversaw the IDW uh, re-release with Scott Dunbeer, the remastering, the coloring by, uh, by Laura Martin. Uh, the, the super deluxe edition where I and Kelvin and I interviewed all of his various like co-conspirators and whatnot, and really tried to put that together using Dave's own words from, you know, from a lot of old interviews and then, you know, mm -hmm. talking to anybody that did anything with those, you know, with, with Dave and whatever. Um, and Kelvin right now actually is working on a documentary about Dave Stevens. that's actually going to premiere, I think the Saturday of San Diego down at San Diego is check your schedule. If you're interested, if you're gonna be at San Diego, check out the documentary. I'm, I'm in it for, I think about a minute or somewhere, but anyway, it's, I think it's really great. Um, anyway, this was, um, a piece that Dave ended up sort of turning into a splash page. He added stuff kind of around it. 
Um, and that art exists. Felix, do you have that art or does someone have that art? I don't know why I feel like you knew where that art was. Anyway, he'll jump in if he remembers. Felix is always good, has a better memory than me, but he remembers my stuff, which I appreciate because I kind of remember my stuff. But anyway, um, this is a piece I bought directly from Dave. I was somewhat shocked when uh, he was sort of willing to sell it. Dave used to do, had this sort of nasty habit of he'd pull some things out to take to San Diego. And then like a guy or two he knew would kind of swing by and like, like sort of make a low ball offer. And then Dave would just kind of, just kind of go like, eh, I'm not that interested. I'm going to just get rid of it. Um, and, uh, and, and and then like kind of like undersell it, whatever. Oh, so Rich, did I not get this from Dave? Dave gifted it to Tom Ranheim. I really thought I got this from Dave, but maybe I'm misremembering it. I got a bunch of other stuff from Dave, but I thought I got this from Dave, but you could be right. I'll have to double check. Tom, oh, Tom Raymond has it. I'm sorry. You're talking about the pieces that go around it. Now I understand. Sorry, Rich. Now you're making sense. Yes, sorry. Understood. So he's got the stuff that makes it the splash page. This I got from Dave, as I thought I did. And, you know, and with Dave, it was always that kind of thing of like, he would kind of come up with a price and I would go, I'd have to go like, I'm going to pay you more than that. You're insane. Um, anyway, <laughs> I, 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 he was a great guy. We used to just love sitting in shitty diners. Yeah, I realized that, Felix. Sorry. Um, uh, we used to love sitting in this shitty diner called the Carl Diner in fucking North Hollywood. It was terrible. It was near Dave's house. He loved it. Um, I, Dave's, Dave's incline, I don't know, Frazetta and Dave, maybe, are we allowed to say things like that? I would say that, um, I, think you I, can. I, I, I just, uh, I mean, just look, look, just look at the piece. I mean, just look at it. I don't know what else to say. The, the, the anatomy, but the ink lines, look at the, like the smoke, the fire, the flame, the, the, the bends of the, of the uniform, um, I, I, yeah. And, uh, boy, uh, I miss them, but yeah, it's a good piece. No, this is also, I, I don't think I've seen any press announcements about the Saturday showing. Of, I don't uh, know if it's on the schedule or where it's on the schedule, but I believe it's Saturday afternoon. I believe it's, you know, one of the, the, one of the hotel room, you know, one, I'm sorry, one of the part of the con, you know, all of yeah. that kind of stuff. I'm sure Kelvin will post about it on various, you know, Facebook and social media things, but uh, I believe it's Saturday uh, and I just check it out. That's the easiest way I can put it. Yeah. No, well, I've, I've been looking forward to it because yeah, I've been good. following Kelvin's posts for the last, uh, it seems like the last year he's been, you know, sharing a little, uh, Clips yeah, as he's the, interviewed the folks and stuff. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, Mr. Red Jack, not the Coral Diner. Don't go there. Just terrible, terrible. <laughs> yeah, I like shitty diners too, like in New York City, but not, not, not this not one. The not the Coral. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, we only have, we only have three more pieces to look at, Dave. Only fourteen more pieces, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So I, you'll forgive me. I mean, number one, this is from a story I wrote. So I wanted to put something up from one of my stories because I feel like people always ask, like, do you ever do? Do you ever write comics? Would you ever write comics? And I have done it once in a blue moon. Uh, I have found that my uh, my metier uh, is to do sort of like a short story that they'll kind of let me do a comedy short story in a book with other more realistic stories. This was from a Harley red white and black uh mini series it was supposed to be online it is adam hughes uh, uh i i came up with the idea for it it was basically harley explaining hanukkah late one night to a guy in a jail cell and she's explaining the sort of miracle of the oil that lasted a lot of days and she's sort of telling the story as she takes revenge on sort of eight criminals that betrayed her and basically sets eight different people on fire, which is sort of her Hanukkah miracle. And then here now on the last page, it is revealed that it was not one magical gasoline uh, can, but she actually had a, a trunk full of gasoline. Um, I kind of pitched it out uh, with DC with a wonderful editor there named, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Curry. Uh, mm, uh, I'm such an asshole with an, a uh oh andy curry god i almost said adam andy curry 
uh, who kind of reached out to me, was a fan of my work. Uh, I never in a million years thought Adam would do it, but Adam was up for it. Uh, needless to say, we didn't make our date that we were supposed to, which was it was supposed to be online first for Christmas. But it was, there you go, Nick, Andy Curry. I, I, I figured it out, though. How about that? Um, but it managed to come out in time for the trade paperback in that spring. So when you picked up the trade paperback, it was these online stories, plus this story by me and Adam and another one wonderful story by uh by Paul Dini uh, that he did. Uh, and this is the last page. And I bought the whole story, which is, uh, I always joke, my my uh, my comic writing career ends up costing me money because they pay me like $300 to write it. And then I buy all the art for a lot more money. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, this is the last page. And I, what I thought was great, and obviously, obviously, Adam does women just wonderfully, of course, of course, of course. Um, but uh uh, I, I just think this, there's just look at the storytelling in this page. And again, what I call the acting, I, that face, I, I just, I just love it. And so it's sort of the big reveal and then into that face. And I just thought it was kind of perfect. So anyway, there you go. <laughs> no, Adam's, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Adam's really fantastic. Is. I have many examples, but this is an example of something I wrote. You... So I wanted to put one in there, but I did not want it to count as one of the 18. So it's number 20, whatever. So there you go. I didn't, I didn't take away art that someone else wanted to see. I just added it on top mm -hmm. of So there you go. So uh, did you, please, uh, you please wrote... check out the story, buy it, buy it, check it out. It's a good story. <laughs> when, when you were writing it, I mean, yeah. we had Adam in mind from the beginning. Um, I knew I pitched the idea, not with Adam. Then they told me Adam would do it. So I knew when I was writing it that like, I knew enough to kind of go dot, 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 full page splash of Harley, you know, lying on a prison cot. I, I was not an idiot, but yeah, no, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but you know, like again, the guys that have collaborated with me and they've all been wonderful look, I'm not going to lie. I haven't quite mastered the art of figuring out my words to a page. I kind of write a script. It's like, I treat it like I'm writing an episode. I write, I write it the way I would write a show. And so it's kind of dialogue and I'm putting stuff in and then I kind of try and show them what I think each page is kind of, but very much in that way. Um, and then more often than not, they kind of come in and they, you know, help me, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. So it's a weird combo of the DC and Marvel method because it's fully scripted and laid out, but then they kind of in a Marvel method way kind of go, no, you're doing it wrong. Try it like this and we kind of get to an answer. Um, and Adam was great about it. I had a wonderful experience with uh, Michael Walsh. We did uh, Hank Johnson, agent of Hydra. Mm -hmm. And I did a rocketeer story uh, for Scott Dumbier. Uh, with Jay Bone, uh, which is sort oh, cool. of a rocketeer kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a Flash Gordon, Adam Strange parody where the rocketeer goes to another, uh, gets zapped to another universe and be kind of become overthrows an evil king and saves an alien princess and all this kind of stuff but he's wrong about the entire thing so i for what it's worth check them all out if you if you're if you're bored so yeah <laughs> you find yourself like rewriting some of the pages after you got the saw the art well i definitely rewrote just because when they improved the layout it allowed me to kind of move word balloons and kind mm -hmm. of you know start to try and at least figure out how to make jokes work in word balloons which is different right. i mean again it's a completely different art form because just the you know the decision to put it all in one line or dot 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 and then a second balloon or and is it an attached balloon or is it better to make their eye kind of go down i mean it, it, again it's been a very much a learning process so uh anyway I, I i've enjoyed it um i'm glad i don't do it all the time because i think it would make me hate comics but i do like <laughs> doing it um i've told people i have a superman story i always wanted to do that dc will never let me do so maybe someday that but uh you know i have the occasional idea but i actually I like not working in comics because I like reading comics and I'm not sure you can do both. I don't think you can read and still enjoy going to a store and buying them. It's like, it's kind of like how I don't like going to the movies or watching TV the way I used to before I was part of it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, speaking of DC, uh -oh. it's a DC piece right here. 
Uh, by the way, another another Tom Horvitz piece. Tom Tom Man. had this on his wall when I met Tom him. Tom like, was like your pusher for a while. No, Tom had this on his wall when I met him. And basically, uh, you know, I was sort of like, someday I will get that out of you. And, and truly many, 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 many years later, it was not a, it was certainly not any kind of easy get, but at some point when Tom left LA and moved up to Vegas and whatever, um, he decided to let go of a couple of things. And this was one of them. And obviously I grabbed it, uh, from the sixties, there are not a lot of bizarro pieces of original art, let alone covers let alone uh twice up covers um and uh you know you can't ask for much more than this uh, it's bizarro it's backwards it's you know it's it's a it's sort of a wonderful crazy you know you most beautiful girl in the universe <laughs> so you marry me yes although i think you should be saying so you marry me no like i but that's my own sort of thing and Again, obviously, uh, as some of you know, I, as I said at the beginning of this whole thing, many hours ago, two, uh, two, uh, two hours and 42 minutes ago, um, I wrote the Bizarro Jerry episode. I have been collecting Bizarro art when I can find it. Um, a lot of the 60s art does not exist. Um, I have this and I have a wonderful Superman Day page. Um, that I got from Richie Halegua at like one of my, another blast from the past from one of my first, maybe my second Comic-Con in like 96. It's the page where he comes to give him a, a, a gift for Superman day. And of course the gift is kryptonite, which of course almost kills him until someone with the initials LL saves his life, but not the LL you think. Uh, and anyway, uh, obviously, uh, I don't know if other, you know, bizarro covers exist. There's a world's finest that's out there um, that has floated around. Uh, but uh, that's the only other. And there's something there's it's been it's very worked on. I'll leave it at that. There's something going on with it that I don't love. But unfortunately, so far, at least the classic um like Bizarro declares war on on the on Earth and all of those with the baby and the baby that's born human that Bizarro sent rockets to Earth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've never never seen them, never found them. Exactly, Ray Cuthbert, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I've never seen any of the other early Bizarro covers, either the Superboy cover or any of the great you know Superman ones. Um, I have a lot of fun pieces from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, including. Um, uh, I have a wonderful piece from our all-star Superman by Frank quietly ding, 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 uh, <laughs> another, uh, another hundred bucks, um, for Mr. Patara. I have a wonderful piece by, uh, forgive me. What's his name? Who does the goon, uh, uh, Powell. uh Powell. Yes, exactly. Um, so I've, I, I have an incredible, uh, Kubert piece from when, uh, Dick Donner was helping, uh, Jeff Johns write the Superman oh, wow. book for a while. It's a wonderful run um, of of action. Uh, I have this great uh, Kubert piece on, that he did, like on this, like uh, it's almost like a like a brown piece of paper. He was sort of sketching and drawing on that for a while. So it's done with like black and white on this brown. It almost looks like he drew it on a paper bag. I don't know how to describe it, but anyway. Um, so I, I love I, Bizarro art uh, because of the it, at the episode. I have a Bizarro Superman sketchbook that I've put pieces up again on my Comic Art Mondays from over the years, where I've tried to get you know the the, the guys I know, the artists I love, and you know have you know worship at, and you know got them to do their version of Bizarro. Sometimes just Bizarro in general. Sometimes where I've been very lucky bizarro versions of some of their own pieces so for example dave gibbons did a bizarro version of for the man who has everything basically the annual cover so things like that and uh, mm -hmm. george, uh, george perez uh may he rest in peace did a incredible bizarro crisis version of crisis parody version of crisis seven where bizarro is laughing about dead supergirl so and but holding her in the classic position sure. with all the bizarros around him and so uh, th that sketchbook sort of is another part of my collecting that very much keeps me going in between the, 
billion dollar you know secret wars pages kind of if that makes sense but again you know another aspect of my collecting that yeah keeps me in it kind of a thing and the the my new book i'm sorry my book is getting near the end i'm actually going to try and get another book started one of these days because there's so many more people i'd like to get in it so uh yeah anyway very very nice like you nick patara anyway um <laughs> he's a busy man these days uh, well, one final piece, and you actually mentioned this artist on this oh, title, uh, -oh. uh, you know, earlier in the conversation. There you go. I had to put it up and mainly for you, uh, Brian Peck, if you're still here, uh, I mentioned Kitty's fairy tale, the, the Cockrum cover, which I love that story. Uh, uh, Brian Peck and I have gone head to head on a couple of pages. Um, uh, I think, uh, there's a couple of guys that have pages. Uh, uh, Migs has some pages. I love this story. Uh, this showed up one day on, I think, Mike Berkey's website on like an afternoon. Uh, oh, look at that. Look at that. Thank you, Nick Vitaro. Much appreciated. Um, uh, Thank you, Nick. Uh, that is going to pay for a lot of naked girls' uh, HD cams. Webcams, yes. Yeah, exactly. That is going to really <laughs> help pay the bill. Um but one of these just very odd days where, you know, you know, and again, I don't do this so much anymore, but because you can't really do it. But in the old days where people like updated their page every day with for sale stuff, I think I hit like a, I hit it on like a Berkey, uh, I hit it on like a, a Berkey thing and this just popped up and I grabbed this. I believe it was Mike Berkey's and I just grabbed it. And it's only happened like that, like two or three times, like art wise in my life. This was one of them. Um, where you just sort of like, I saw the listing and it was something like classic X-Men 57. And I don't even think the art had shown up. Maybe it came in an email first. And I just was like, classic X-Men 57. That sounds familiar. Like, you know, did a, an image search. I went, oh my God. I was just like, I'll take it. You know, it was like one of those things. Um, the other time was um, a wonderful uh, Gotham by Gaslight piece that came up that I grabbed off of actually off of the CAF um, that, uh, oh God, I can't think of his name. The longtime Superman collector. Uh, God, someone will remember his name in a minute. The piece, I put the story up in the description. It's a pretty funny description if I say so myself, where I said yes to the piece. And then he was, of course, flooded with people going like, hey, can you, uh, I'll give you $100 if you fuck over whoever bought it and whatever. And <laughs> God bless the guy for uh, not uh, not not taking it and I got it. And so that was another time where he just sort of randomly hit the reload button and it wasn't there and then a piece showed up. And then uh, years and years ago, um, a whole bunch of, uh, cock I'm sorry, Cockrum, of uh, Dave Gibbons' Watchmen pages um at comic showcase paul hudson's old store mm -hmm. in uh in uh in london where a whole bunch showed up like that uh so anyway uh one it has it happened three times in my life uh no super wars one cover there are no new stories there but you can go see it uh i don't know i think it's on my cf or maybe it's not i don't even remember anymore sorry i don't think i gave it to you did i give it to you maybe i did i don't know what i gave you super wars, no. no sorry <laughs> Like it's like, well, that, that's why I, 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 when I got the artwork, I kind of had in my mind what you were going to give me. And by and large, I didn't get anything that I thought you were going to send. What so. piece did you most want that I didn't send, or were you thinking you were going to get, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, you know, I mean, I just figured like the giant size X Men was always one that is just good to talk about. And, and, and knowing that I'm an X Men fan too, I just kind of expected that one to be there. And it like, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Like I said, I just figured, ah, what more is there to say about it? I just, yeah, no, I get it. No, the, well, that's what made this really, really fun. I mean, and I, I and I, I thought it was, you know, again, and you, the thing you've had such. Am a I allowed to share? can i share the secret wars cover if i hit the share button or that doesn't work how does that work? Uh, if i you, email you a pay if i email this to you right now can mm. you add this up and show that we'll end with secret wars one can you I can does do that, that work yeah, absolutely if you sending it to you right now okay to gmail is that right bill yep send it to that one and i'm coming will get right it. now there you go that's how we're going to end that's the final the final uh final piece <laughs> uh, a glorious ending uh, thank you guys for sticking around for this. Uh, I don't know how long these things normally go, but uh, two hours, 50 minutes, pretty good. I yeah, think. Uh, yeah. This is too uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, I got to get this saved over to my computer. Yeah. Here. Sorry. It, it came through. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I just got it. Uh, okay. I'm just getting it downloaded now.
<laughs> this is not a secret, Rick. Uh, let's see, David, has the cover to Ambush Book One ever surfaced? Um, I've never seen the one cover. Uh, I wonder if one of the guys involved with it has it. I've never seen it. That's absolutely right. Um, I'm trying to see what, any other questions here while he's doing that. Uh, 118 likes. Thanks, everyone. I hope that's as good. Uh, there we go. Look at that. How's that for an end? Da -da. Yeah. Um, uh, this was an Albert piece on the wall at San Diego. I don't think he would be shy in me telling you this. Uh, my good friend, Chuck Costas, Zek collector extraordinaire, just didn't want to be the guy that at the time spent, I want to say it was either 20 or $25,000 on a Zek piece. This was at the time that seemed like real money. Not that it isn't real money now, but you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like now it sort of seems like not as much, you know, I, again, compared to the $47 million, uh, first appearance of the black costume. Uh, yeah, no black costume. I'll take this uh, any old day. Uh, this to me, uh, again, you know, Secret Wars, you know, those Marvel miniseries and then this idea of this maxi series, as somebody that was buying comics on the stand and they disappeared at the last page, you know, the thing showed up in the park and it disappeared. And then all of a sudden a year, whatever. And then the next issue, they were back with all these changes. And then mm -hmm. finally, whenever it was a couple of months later or that summer secret wars and the, you know, this was the ad piece. And then, you know, a version of this was the cover to one and, you know, the 12 together are great. It's kind of crazy. You know, when you reread it now, they're like, you know, they fight, they don't fight, they stop fighting, they kind of, you know, eat for an episode, you know, an issue. I mean, it's kind of all over the place. It's it's just great. And it was sort of, I mean, my guess is it will probably one day be like a Marvel movie, but this cover was just like, this doesn't exist. Like all these guys were here. You know what I mean? They're all there and they're fighting the big villains. And oh God, I don't even know what to say. It just, Secret Wars 1 was was it for me. I had toys even. I just, this was the piece. And for me, it was sort of like, I'm not going to have any other ones. And so at the time, again, you know, it was something that felt a little high, but worth it. And I grabbed it and I certainly, uh, as they say, no regrets. Uh, I think it's, it's a real just fave. And uh, uh, Zach and Beatty working just again, like, again, I think a lot of that rest of that book, there's multiple inkers, there's rush stuff, there's cover redos. Jim Shooter made them. I don't even know, do like some covers like three and four times and different versions, but this one was it. And even I think Jim Shooter knew that. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's it's incredible. It's it, this, you look at something like this and you wonder why why did he even want to sell it? Maybe it was a consignment. I mean, uh, no, I mean Albert, you know, I'm sure he bought it for a dollar, and who knows? You know, every yeah. year he breaks something out, so it just you know. <laughs> well, that's why everybody yeah. goes to Albert's booth at San Diego. I mean, he uh, he always surprises you with. with There's the always movie. something. It's a, yeah. it's always an exciting surprise of what he breaks out. And also to check out the pieces from last year and their new prices. It's a double bonus of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He'd be well, so mad to hear that. But anyway. <laughs> is it 11 by 17? As no, well as... oversized. Okay, uh, yeah, I think yeah, uh, yeah. Larry asked that question earlier. Yes. But, so it is oversized as well. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. unbelievable. Well, <laughs> you're right. If, if, if we had to end on a piece, this is a good one to end on. This is... Uh, always one of the most memorable I feel covers. like we should have gone five more minutes to get to three hours under the south, but oh well i'm sorry i apologize everyone <laughs> no i think knights of old asked this question earlier so maybe you can you can sum it up in a way uh, did did acquiring pieces from childhood change your emotional relationship with the nostalgic aspect of of having read them and and, and whatnot i mean for me i i don't think it would but what, what about you i mean did... no i mean if anything it just made it better i mean i don't know i mean I don't, it's hard to say it's more intense. Uh, maybe it is a bit. Um, it, 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 it's certainly the ability to sort of take it and hold it and thumb through it. Not that I can't do that with the comic, which by the way, again, not that I don't want to find the art that I want to find, but if I can't find the art, I have the comic, which is a mm -hmm. great thing because sure. the, the concrete, like the, something you can 
hold and reread and retouch is truly wonderful. I do feel like getting these originals pushes me into this sort of stratosphere because it's this other this other thing. It was part of the process of like how it was made and like they touched it and all those things. I sound a little OCD, but no, well, it's all a part like of it. It's all a part of it. And so it it does magnify having it. And I do love, I mean, you know, it is that thing of like, these are stories I have reread over and over and over again. And to this day, go back and reread these over and over and over again. And even have some of them, not that I love like reading on my iPhone, but I have some of these even in my silly, like, you know, whatever it's called, comics college mm -hmm. app, that if I'm on a set and I'm waiting, you know, 20 minutes for something and I don't have anything else to do, yeah, sometimes I just I reopen Secret Wars and I read it for a bit, you know, and kill 20 minutes or something like that. It's a very, very lovely way to spend the 20 minutes while you're waiting for something to get lit or whatever. Um, and uh, boy, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. Well, um, but it, to me, this yeah. ties directly into your uh, collecting props, right? Because it's it's you can see the movie anytime you want. It's like if you can't own yeah. something from the comic, you can. No, read absolutely. Comic absolutely. But it does it very much just takes me back. It, it really, really does. And, uh, I just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's sort of my, my reason for collecting. I mean, it's a lot of people's reason for collecting, but that's the best way I can kind of explain it. So, yeah. Well, I, I you know, this has been a lot of fun. We are, and, and we are just moments away from the three hour mark, but Dave, this is a, <laughs> this is a good 100th show for us. To I have. promise everyone I'll be back for episode 200 with 200 pieces. We'll do 200 <laughs> pieces. And we're going to uh, start it much earlier yeah. in the day. It'll probably It'll be at 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It'll be a 12 a hour one, a bit of a <laughs> kind of a longer kind of a thing. Did I win the duel? Did I win the duel of the dealers? You did. Okay. You did. You, yeah, um, you, hey, you, thank you. you. <laughs> I want to say thank you for everyone who stuck around uh this was uh, very enjoyable great questions and comments and jumping in on everything so thank you and bill uh much appreciated thank you no, for, my, my pleasure uh, yeah, i'm gonna having me yeah. Time about yeah thank you for having me finally bill no <laughs> yeah, um. <laughs> i felt so bad dave you you were on like on a list and i decided for some reason i thought you i actually think i when you said to me, by the way, it's our hundredth episode, it put a smile on my face. I was just like, Oh, that's great. I'm happy with it. I'll take I'll take hundred. I, I was like just that. waiting yeah. for you. I mean, yeah, you know, well, thank we you. had to thank reach you. that milestone. But, a wonderful uh, unplanned accident. So I'll take exactly. It. Um, so you're gonna be at San Diego, right? I will be at San Diego with my mask on. So uh, that's how you'll know it's Understood. me. Uh, orange mask. You'll see me. I usually an orange mask, uh, but that'll be me okay. not taking the mask off unless maybe okay. we're outside. So uh, was at the Star Wars show. Everyone around me, no mask. Everybody four days later, sick with COVID. So enjoy, everyone. See you at San Diego. <laughs> um, but seriously, I was just going to say, uh, I'm on CAF. I respond. I'm on social media at David H. Mandel. I respond. Uh, anyway, I'm around. I thank you, everyone. Honestly, I do appreciate it. It was really fun. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you in San Diego with the mask on. And, um, you know, I mean, if there's any, every, everybody should definitely check out the the podcast that uh, Dave's a part of. It's, it, it, it is fascinating. And I've, I've only listened to like five episodes, but it's, it's fun. I mean, it's a different aspect of collecting that I think we as art collectors can really relate to as well. So I, I would encourage anybody who, uh, who hasn't listened to it yet to give it a try. 20 more seconds. Hold on. Uh, so anyway, what else is going on in the world? Uh, what did Biden do today? Um, no, um, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, please check out the podcast. Uh, I don't know. Check out my comics that I mentioned. Follow me on social media. I don't know. I'm 20, 57, 58, 59, and, and you're, you're three right. hours. There we go. <laughs> All Goodbye. right. David. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, this, you know, I think I can't tell you how much I, I, I you know, I'm glad that you were the hundred hundredth episode for me tonight because it really it was a joy. You, you've you've had a collection uh, on calf that for years has uh, I, I mean clearly not just brought a joy to me but to so many other people. You know the, the hobby oh, is you. really about uh, sharing and appreciating you know the, the medium and uh, and and you were you know you were one of the many early adopters of calf and so I can't tell you how much having support from collectors whose collections I admired you know as I was getting started made me realize you know the calf was a cool was actually a good idea and it, and it could have right. helped you know help truly a great idea thing. although one day we have to figure out how to get my premium membership 
and my subscriptions to the auction and the dealer data <laughs> so lined you, you, up into one I'm, one thing. That's the dream that I, I know just that do you it once do like a year. Six months apart. We, yes, yeah, you're right. It's really, it next time makes me. It, it does not. My OCD does not enjoy that. It makes me crazy. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna. Yeah. You know, next time we we the renewal comes up, I'm just gonna set them both. I'm gonna advance the other one an extra six months. I, I'm good for it. I'm good for the money. I'll I'll, I'll just do it. I'll, I'll I'll bulk pay you. You could offer me a ten year deal, whatever you like. I'm in. <laughs> just got to get it into one email. It All right, I, so we can work happy. that out. Yeah, one we, we one can. press a button. I'm so jealous of the people that only press the button once, and I do it twice a year. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we will fix that. Thank so, you. Uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in tonight. This was a whole lot of fun for me. I know it was a whole lot of fun for you as well. So, uh, uh, have a wonderful evening, and you'll be. Uh, I'll be back here again tomorrow night at nine nine p.m. And I will not. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Good night, everybody.